What do you got there, Mr. Optus? Business success strategies for Australians by Australians. Well, maybe even you could learn some new tricks. Really? You know Optus is sponsoring it. You don't say. Yeah, it's all about competition. If we can help your business to grow, then our business will grow along with yours. I suppose you're handing these out to everyone in town? Yeah. See my competition across the street? He's an old dog. He doesn't want to learn any new tricks. You know what I mean? Yes. Welcome to The Winning Edge, a program of business success strategies for Australians by Australians. You will be introduced to strategies that will benefit you and your business. Through this program, you are achieving one important strategy. You are working on your business instead of in your business. This is your opportunity to take on new ideas to activate your creative thinking and to most importantly, learn new strategies that will not only improve your business, but change the way you do business. It's time to focus on how to achieve business growth, how to attract more customers, how to turn your existing customers into fans, and to understand how to achieve maximum productivity and loyalty from your staff by turning your place of work into a happier environment. Today's program features three outstanding business people. They are Simon Reynolds. So what are the four characteristics of all successful people? First of all, successful people knock, 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 knock on doors until they open. There's a huge myth about successful people shared by failures. Bob Pritchard, CEO, Pritchard Marketing Incorporated. You've got to go out of your way to give more service. Brad Cooper, CEO of FAI Home Security. Be daring, be different, but do it. Do it, do it, do it, do it. Consider the possibility that one idea you pick up today may be the key to accomplishing what you set out to achieve. Welcome to The Winning Edge. Simon Reynolds was responsible for all the highly successful advertisements that you're now watching. At age 21, he masterminded the famous Grim Reaper campaign. Just two years later, he started Omon agencies with offices in Sydney and New York. The New York Times voted Omon in the top five most creative agencies in New York. In 1992, he started Andromeda Agency, and within two years, his agency won the highest advertising award in the world, the Grand Prix at Cannes. He's also a winner of the New South Wales Young Achievers Award. And is a former board member and is currently a consultant for John Singleton Advertising. He's not only one of Australia's leading experts in advertising, but has won international acclaim in it as well. He's a powerful speaker and educator who puts his heart and soul into helping businesses succeed. Today he'll share his insights on how to maximize your advertising dollar. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Simon Reynolds. In the next 55 minutes, I'm going to be talking about advertising and small business. And a lot of small business people are suspicious of what advertising can actually do for them, and quite rightly so. You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, it's all right for the big companies, the Pepsis, the Coca-Colas, the McDonald's. Of course, they need advertising. But what can a small business person like me get out of it? Well, I just want to say one thing right up front. A lot of these giant corporations were once one-person small businesses. Really, you know, like Coca-Cola only started when someone sold a recipe to one man for Coca-Cola for 500 bucks. Good deal, huh? Also, McDonald's, you know, there wouldn't even be a McDonald's except for one person, Ray Kroc, noticing that one hamburger joint did a lot more business than all the rest. So even though, yes, advertising works for big businesses, it's absolutely instrumental in making small businesses big. 
And the second reason so many people are suspicious of, of advertising for small businesses is they tried it and it didn't work. You know, they said, you know, it's all right for you to say that, mate, but, you know, I did my brochures and I spent 300 bucks printing them and I sent them out everywhere. And the only person who replied was my mum. Well, that's true. A huge amount of small business advertising doesn't work. But the reason is because so many small businesses have never learnt the strategies that make ads, ads work. And, you know, you shouldn't blame yourself because no one's taught you. And that's what we'll be trying to do today in the first hour. The very first thing, the paramount thing that all small businesses should learn when it comes to their advertising, indeed when it comes to the entire strategy for their business, is this. You need to have a proposition. A proposition that's different from other people. Now that sounds pretty obvious, but let me tell you this terrible statistic. You don't want to hear this so early in the morning, but I've got to tell you anyway. Almost four out of five new businesses will fail or go broke in the next five years. And out of the one that survives, in the five years after that, four out of five of them will go under. Now there's a lot of reasons for this, but one of the primary ones is, is they're offering exactly the same things as everybody else. You know, they open up a carpet cleaning company, say, and, and they say, listen, we've got this great carpet cleaning company, we offer nothing else, no advantage over anybody else, come to us. And then they're really surprised when people don't come. That's a very painful thing for a lot of people to realise. So um, even if you started your own business now already, if you work on a unique proposition, it will save you 20 years of hell trying to make it work. To set yourself up in a new category, just a slight variant from everybody else, is absolutely crucial to small business success, and most don't do it. And people say, well, you know, mate, my business has been around for 150 years, this type of business. It's, you can't think of anything new, but you can. I'm not saying it's easy. It takes a lot of work. Say for the next two weeks, you should at least spend 30 minutes a day thinking with your associates about a niche that will work for your business, a new category to move into. Because history says, first people in a new category don't just do well temporarily, they do well for 50 years. And categories are being opened up all the time. You know, 15 years ago, Freedom Furniture was not in this country. It didn't exist. But what they did is they found a niche that no one had thought of. There was expensive furniture and there was cheap furniture. Trouble was, a lot of the cheap furniture looked cheap. So what Freedom did is they said, okay, there's a niche here. We will do cheap furniture, but we'll try our darndest to make it look expensive. Huge success nationally. You know, a lot of people, probably three quarters of the people in this room have an item of Freedom Furniture in their houses. They went public last year, and if you read the Fin Review last week, you would have seen that after their first year of public trading, even now they're 10% above projections. And it all started with having a niche. Now, if at the end of really sincerely working out your business and finding that it doesn't have a niche, that you can't find one, which I'd be surprised at, the next thing you've got to do is focus on one single thing. See, it's a huge problem with businesses. They do three or four different things, or they say six or seven things about why you should come to them. And basically, in marketing, no one hears it. Unless you say just one thing again and again and again and again, particularly when you've got a small budget, being a small business person, no one hears it. But if you pick one thing that you should master and you say it in all your communications, then people will get it. That's from a matchbox to the t-shirt you wear to how you answer the phone. It might be friendliness, it might be price, it might be quality, it might be locations. But you, you just say one again and again and again and you sledgehammer people with it till finally they get, ah, that's the company that offers that. Because they can't remember the five or six things everybody else is saying. Focus. It's the difference between sunlight, you know, it's a great day today, we can walk out, out there, and we won't get burnt unless we're out there for, you know, three or four hours. But you take a laser beam, which is one billionth the power of the sun, but simply because it's focused, it'll go right through your skin in a second. That's the difference between focus and non-focused businesses. And it's so crucial. And you know, the advantage, the advantage you pick might be in your disadvantage. For instance, if you're really slow when it comes to uh, uh, the manufacture of your product, you might want to turn that into, a, into an advantage. You say, okay, everybody else can get it to you in one week. We take three weeks. Here's why. We have 15 quality checks. We do this, we do that, we do this, we, we do that. We source the materials from here. 
And so you turn the, advantage, uh, the disadvantage into an advantage. Avis, their tagline is, we try harder. Right? Now let me tell you, that's 25 years old. And the reason they have that tagline is because 25 years ago, they were in the red and doing bad. They were a very, very distant uh, number two to Hertz. And, you know, they were thinking to themselves, and there'll be people out here thinking the same things, how can I possibly compete with the leader? They've got better cars, they've got better quality. You know, they've got more locations. No wonder we're in the red. Why would anyone want to go with number two? Well, there's an advantage in every disadvantage. Let me read an ad in the 19, from the 1960s about how Avis turned it round. The headline says, Avis is only number two in rented cars, so why go with us? And the copy says, we try harder. This is the first time anyone had heard this line, in this case in the States. When you're not the biggest, you have to. We just can't afford dirty ashtrays or half-empty gas tanks, or worn wipers, or unwashed cars, or low tyres, or anything less than seat adjusters that adjust, heaters that heat, defrosters that defrost. Obviously, the thing we try hardest for is just to be nice, to start you out right with a new car, like a lively super torque Ford, and a pleasant smile. To know, say, where you get a good pastrami sandwich in Duluth. Why? Because we can't afford to take you for granted. Go with us next time. The line at our counter is shorter. <laughs> 25 years later, it's worked so well, they've still got, got that as a tagline. There's an advantage in every disadvantage. OK, I want to give you seven easy ways to maximize your advertising dollar and to make a lot more money through advertising. The first is one of the golden opportunities, truly one of the missed opportunities for both individuals and corporations. And that is the yellow pages. Now I know a lot of individuals don't advertise in yellow pages, but if you're a salesperson, I don't see why you shouldn't. And when you hear the stats on it, you'll want to. 32% of all people look in the yellow pages before they actually buy a product. That's almost one in three. 3 million people, in fact 3.5 million people, look in the yellow pages every week. And 2 million people in this country alone buy from the yellow pages every single week. Over 400 million bucks is spent on yellow pages advertising in this country. And over half of it is wasted. 2 million people wanting to buy and no one's selling. Truly. If you can maximize your Yellow Pages ad, you can crucially affect your profitability of your small business. The first step to doing so is to buy the biggest ad you can possibly afford. The, more, the bigger the ad, the more response you get. Well, that's pretty obvious. But it's actually, independent research from Queensland has found out, it's actually far in excess to the price that you pay. If you buy, let's say, the smallest display ad, and you switch to the largest, the quarter page, it'll cost you four times more. But it will get, on average, 11 times the response. Cost you four times more, gets 11 times the response. Now think of that in real people, 11 times more people ringing up through the yellow pages. And if you can't afford the quarter page, because we know it's very expensive, each bigger size you get is a greater increase than the amount you actually pay. But people think they're saving money getting the small size. Not true. Number two. Tell them what's in it for them. No one does this. You know, like they say, plumber, all areas. Or for all your Venetian blind needs. You know, and a big phone number. That doesn't sell anybody on anything, but everybody's doing the same thing. What an opportunity. If all you did was say five reasons why we're the best plumber on this page and listed them, that would immediately make your ad outsell everybody else on the page because no one's doing any selling. There's two things every ad in the world must do. Number one, it must inform. And number two, it must persuade. Yellow Pages advertising and a lot of small business advertising is doing no persuasion whatsoever. You know, they just put the logo up big or the phone number up big. The logo's not going to sell anybody on anything. It doesn't matter how good your logo is. 
You know, you can have a beautiful smiling moose or something, and no one's going to say, look at that smiling moose, I'll just open my wallet. It's not going to happen. Nor a big phone number. Big phone numbers all over. 24 hours, big phone number. Oh, it's 946789. Oh, let me just get my wallet out. That doesn't sell anybody. People have put down what sells, and they put up what doesn't. In all kinds of small business advertising, and indeed big business advertising. By not doing that, you can turn your fortunes around. Next thing, statistically, photos work a lot better. If you put a photo in a Yellow Pages ad, you will get higher response. No one does it, that's one of the reasons. And if you put a photo of yourself or of a person, you'll get even higher response. I guess it's probably because people like to see who they're dealing with, and if they have to do their quotes by Yellow Pages, at least they can get you know, a feeling for you. No one does it, but it works. This next thing, will on average, and in fact it's been found to increase sales by up to 20 times, independently researched, by up to 20 times. And there's probably 3% of Yellow Pages ads that include this thing. And all it is, is a headline. That's it, a headline. A lot of you are reading the newspaper today, and if you looked at an ad at all, you only looked at the headline, and if that didn't interest you, you didn't get into the copy, right? In fact, Ogilvy and Mather advertising research says that around 80% of people only ever read the headline. But there's no headlines in Yellow Pages ads. So there's nothing to drag you into the message. Luckily, no one else is putting in headlines either. So they're not getting an advantage over you. But if you do, individual or corporation, you do a Yellow Pages ad and you put a headline in it, you get up to 20 times higher response. So those little things can dramatically increase your effectiveness with Yellow Pages. There's one great uh, marketing gimmick I actually heard about very recently, someone's doing with Yellow Pages, so I'll, I'll tell you. Um, it's a pizza company, and apparently they've opened a, this new pizza parlor in another suburb, and they really want to you know, take their competitor's business. So they've got this great gimmick where they offered a two-for-one pizza offer. You get two pizzas for the price of one, and all you've got to do is bring in the competitor's Yellow Pages ad. So, of course, you know, so people tear it out and they go in, they get the two-for-one pizza. And a month later, they want a pizza, you see, and they open the yellow pages, there's nothing there except for the guys that, you know, put the, did the promo. I love marketing scams like that. And people have been doing them for, for decades. You know, even as early as the Korean War, the uh, Office of Special Services at the U.S. Army, um, apparently they used to drop these caches of supplies and include it in absolutely normal supplies for the communist Koreans to actually pick up was this box of condoms. But in this box of condoms, they were all made to super extra large size. And it was all, all very legit. And on the, on the top, it just said, US Army condoms made in USA, size medium. <laughs> just to psych out the communists. OK, the third step to maximizing your small business advertising is to use advertorials. Now, what are advertorials? Well, they're half ad, they're half editorial. Quite often, especially when you've got local papers, you're reading local papers, when you read a complimentary article about a salesperson or about a company, well, they've actually paid for it. But the great thing is that not a lot of people realize that. The thing is, people are suspicious of ads. They actually don't trust advertising people. I mean, I don't know why. Look at this face. But they don't. And even more incredibly, they trust journalists. So what happens is when the, when the ad is written by a journalist, people believe it. It's a tremendous opportunity. The other great opportunity, of course, is you can do a lot longer copy than normal. You can sell a lot more. And you know, in general, the more you tell, the more you sell. As long as it's relevant, it's not, as long as it's not just rubbish. And you know, people are very bored by their own products that they sell, quite often, because they live with them. But at least for a while, people are interested in your product. At least for the time they've got to buy it. You know that only 2% of Australians actually buy motor cars at any one point of time. But still the car companies spend hundreds of millions advertising to them. Because they know that that 2% may not be many. Everybody else is bored by the ad. But that 2% is still worth a lot of money. Same with the advertorials. A lot of people won't read them. But someone interested in your business will, even if it's long copy. But you've got to make the copy interesting. And that's hard. You've got to dig deep for facts about your company. And people say, mate, if you saw my product, you know, people wouldn't read three lines about it. But there's no product on earth 
that you can't make interesting if you're prepared to dig deep enough. One of the masters of this is an English guy by the name of David Abbott and uh, he can find something interesting about any single product and he always puts uh, one of these relevant amazing facts into his ads. For instance, he was doing this ad for Weller hair conditioner and so he thought to himself, well who buys hair conditioners? Mostly women and mostly women who are blow drying their hair. So he did all this research and he found out this amazing fact that the average hairdryer puts out enough heat in half an hour to bake a sponge cake. So he does this ad and it just says the average hairdryer puts out enough heat to bake a sponge cake. What's it doing to your hair? And all these women are reading and they go, my God. So they, it then says, you need well a conditioner for this, this and this reason. People think it's fantastic and you know, well sales did really well. And even as a, a boring product like mineral water, he found something fascinating about. And this wasn't just, you know, flavoured kind of deep spring mineral water. It was the flavourless kind. And it was from a supermarket, Sainsbury's, which is like Woolworths. So if you can find something interesting about that, you're doing well. Well, he did. The headline said, from Sainsbury's comes a drink no one's ever drunk before. It's kind of interesting. But the killer fact was in the copy. True fact. He says, the average person, when you drink the average glass of water, it's been drunk seven times before by other people. Someone's drunk it, they pissed it out, it's gone into the sewage, it's gone uh, evaporated into the clouds, it's come down again into a dam. Someone else has drunk it, they pissed it out into the clouds, up and down, but drunk it, drunk it, drunk, pissed and drunk and drink and pissed. You don't want to drink water like this. You need Sainsbury's mineral water. No one's ever drunk it. That's the power of coming up with interesting facts. And you've got to fill all your communications to your client with that. And it takes effort. The other great thing about advertorials is you do them five times a year, and then when you cold call someone, quite often they've heard of you and they don't know how, but they, they know it's in a complimentary way. Or after about eight months, they keep on seeing this salesperson, and so they give them a ring because you know, there's all these articles that have been written about them. OK, very quickly, number four, letterbox drops. You know, you, you're going to go home tonight and your letterbox is going to be jam-packed with all this stuff. And you're going to just put it in the bin. And you think to yourself, well, does anybody actually ever read this crap? Well, amazingly, some suckers do. And it's very easy to reach them. All you have to do is two things. To turn, you know, what is effectively a multi-billion dollar business in this country in your favour. The first is to keep your brochures really, really simple. A lot of small businesses are always trying to be creative. They get the computer graphics and they put all doodles everywhere. Keep it simple. And keep your language simple. In general, don't be too clever. Don't try and be too creative. Just put your message really clearly. So just before they put it in the bin, they get sold really, really quickly. In almost all cases, and not just in advertising, simple words communicate a lot better than complex, flowery, more entertaining words. And I want to give an example of this with... Uh, a poem, and it goes like this. Scintillate, scintillate, globlu vivific. Vain would I fathom thy nature specific. Loftily poised in ether capacious, strongly resembling a gem carbonaceous. Well, I don't know about you, but it doesn't mean much to me. But let me say exactly the same thing in simple language. And you tell me which is more memorable. I'll say it sentence by sentence. Complex poem first, then the same thing in simple language. Scintillate, scintillate, globlu vivific. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. Vain would I fathom thy nature specific. How I wonder what you are. Loftily poised in ether capacious, up above the world so high, strongly resembling a gem carbonaceous, like a diamond in the sky. That's the power of simple words which is more memorable. The second thing is to actually make your brochures 20% different. And what do I mean by 20%? Well, once again, you've got, to, um, you've got to keep them simple. But if you keep them so simple that it's boring, it's just going to be part of the bin process. And the hard part is the balance. If you go too creative, it could take two seconds, three seconds before people understand the message that you're trying to push forward. So you just go 20% different. It might be a little thing, like the, your brochure is in a different shape or a different colour or an unusual typeface or it has an unusual photo. But you still keep it simple enough that the message is there in a second. 
because so often people cloud their communications with, um, with just too much stuff to make it interesting, too many elements. But, you know, when you actually look at the stats, you really must make a difference. And that's the problem that a lot of other people make the mistake with. Do you know that the average person sees 1,600 different advertising messages a day? 1,600, according to the, to the research. Let's say they're only half right. Let's say it's only 800. Yesterday, you saw 800 messages, advertising messages, all types, you know, from, from Matchbox t-shirts, trucks going past, to 60-second television commercials. Let's just do a quick test here. Out of the 80, 800 messages on ads that you saw in the last 24 hours, who can remember half? Just half. 400. No way. What about 100? Just an eighth. 100 out of 800 that you saw yesterday. What about 50? Put your hand up if you remember 20 out of the 800 messages you saw, saw yesterday. 10! No hands. What about five? Anyone remember five advertising messages out of the 800? What about three? Anybody remember three? Out of 800, one person. Who can remember two messages out of the 800 they saw yesterday? About seven. Who can remember one message out of the 800 they saw yesterday? About 22, 23. Now that is a failure rate our industry can be justly proud of. That's unbelievable. I mean, imagine any other business getting away with that. Imagine if brain surgeons only got it right one out of 800 times. Imagine builders only got it right one out of 800 times. We'd all be wearing crash helmets. No industry would get away with it. And why do we have this problem? Because everybody does ads exactly the same as everybody else. Or they do them so complex that people can't understand it and they just can't be bothered. 20% different. It's the key. It's the safest way to do creativity without endangering your product. Next way to increase small business success through advertising is radio. A lot of small businesses have made a lot of money with good radio ads. There's three principles you've got to stick to. The first is to reduce complexity. And the reason is because radio is a background medium. What do I mean background medium? Well, when you're watching television, you're basically watching television. When you're reading the newspaper or the magazine, you're basically reading the newspaper or magazine. But the radio, you're always doing something else, aren't you? You're either driving or you're talking to somebody, having barbecue, something like that. It's a background medium. And that means we must change our structure. Most radio ads are full of all this noise and garb, right? Because it's a background medium, the ear doesn't pick it up. It's just part of the background. So what you have to do is reduce all the elements in your ad. So there's only a few things, there's only something really fundamental that you say. And immediately the ear will kind of pick up the change in tone that's going and listen, at least for a moment, to what you're saying. And I want to give you just a really simple example now. This is for Pepsi, very boring brief for uh, teenagers that um, they had three different bottle sizes. Pepsi has a variety of refreshment options to suit any size first. There's the 375 mil Pepsi, uh. the 500 mil Pepsi, uh. and now the new one liter first Terminator. Uh. The first Terminator, Pepsi's new one liter bottle for very thirsty young gentlemen. Like the sound of it? Well, pick one up from your local Quicks food store. So obviously to reach teenagers, you know, the, the best method is to be crass. So they, they did that. But if you actually look at the structure, it's just three burps of different sizes. Just a very elementary idea. And when you do that with radio, it stands out so much more than people, you know, hitting you with a million sound effects all the time. The next principle of radio is to use pictures. What do I mean use pictures? A radio ad. Well, that's your great advantage. You see, you can take people anywhere in a radio ad. And you can't afford to do that with a TV ad quite often or even a print ad because of the cost of photography. But with radio, you can say, listen, here we are on top of uh, Mount Tai in China and uh, I'm sitting here with, uh, um, you know, like a bald-faced eagle or something like that. Or you can say, here I am flying on top of a pink elephant over the sedan. You can take people anywhere. I'll just give you a quick example. This is an uh, American ad for a company called Yardbase Garden Products. And just 
see how effortlessly they take you into a supermarket. It is Saturday morning as you angrily push a shopping cart with a broken wheel through the lawn and garden department of a large retail store. You silently curse the impending yard work that will make your weekend a living hell. I don't want to waste my weekend pulling the weeds, fertilizing... And then, in the middle of a string of adjectives you'll never hear on primetime TV, you bump into a large display rack, and six bottles of Yard Basics fall into your cart. Yard Basics? What the f*** is that? Three sprays that fertilize your lawn and garden, and three sprays that kill weeds and insects. You just took a bottle of Yard Basics up to a hose, spray it around the yard, and you're done. Which means you'll have plenty of time to do whatever the f*** you want this weekend. That means I can go water skiing, play tennis, collect butterflies, but more importantly, with Yard Basics, I don't feel the need to curse anymore. Then you realize you locked your keys in the car. Oh, I locked the keys in the car! Yard Basics from Ortho. Believe it. The easy way out of yard work. So once again, you know, instantly you're in a supermarket and radio has that power, the power of pictures. And finally, use silence. Because there's so much noise in radio ads, because that's all they have to play with, if you use silence, and once again, the ear picks it up immediately. So let me give you a quick example set in a doctor's surgery. Um, Mrs. Johnson, anyone in reception? No, Dr. Scott. No phone calls? No, Dr. Scott. Ah, OK, thanks. Um, Mrs. Johnson, anyone rung for me? No, Dr. Scott. Ah, thank you. Uh, Strepsils. For the relief of serious sore throats, Strepsils works. Oh, and uh, see your doctor if symptoms do persist. Mrs. Johnson, is it time to go home yet? No, Dr. Scott. Okay. You strictly as directed. Marketed by the Boots Company, New Zealand Limited, Wellington. Mm. So you see that really what's happened there is just everything's been taken out and it's a much different pace to all the other ads. And if, when that was presented as a script to the client, they would have said, oh, it's pretty boring, isn't it? But surrounded by all that mess and sound, it stands out. Number six, press ads. Let me give you some very simple hints when it comes to press ads. Number one, use power words. Some words actually get higher response than others. For instance, the word new in a headline. Statistically, often people respond to a headline with the word new in it. How to also works well. How to do this, how to save this amount of money. Because it looks like it's giving people advice. Announcing or introducing also works well because it gives the impression that once again there's something worthy of announcing or introducing. I've got a list of about 30 other power words actually in the cassettes we sell, but I actually don't have time to say them all here. Very quickly, um, the next thing you need to do on press ads, in general, if you've got a great offer, put it in the headline. Don't let your, your, head, uh, your great offer, even if it's a little complex, be in the body copy, simply because so few people are actually reading the body copy. Just put it up straight and let your offer do all the work in the headline. Reduce typefaces. The less typefaces you use, the higher your readership will be. People who are, who are producing their own ads are always putting in a million typefaces, and in general, it reduces readership. Finally, use subheads. In all your communications, once they reach any length, use subheads. For the eye, it breaks up the copy, so it doesn't look like it's so much to read. And also, if someone doesn't have time to read your whole communication, they just read the subheads and they get a general gist of what you're talking about. So you can sell them even if they're just flicking the page or flicking your brochure. Okay, this next thing is absolutely instrumental. It leads to, on average, an increase in 20% in sales for all small businesses. And hardly anyone has the balls to do it. I'm going to tell it to you now, and most of you aren't going to do it. But if you did, you would transform your business. But most of you won't do it. So what is it? It's offer a money-back guarantee. And immediately people go, oh, I can't possibly offer a money-back guarantee. All the sleaze bags I deal with, they'll all be ringing up. 
Or people say, oh, I can't do that. You know, my product costs 15,000 bucks to buy. You know, what if I have to offer, give them my money back after that? I've already put the extension on my house. Offer a money back guarantee. It's such a fundamental way to separate yourself from everybody else because no one else does it, number one. Number two, it says your product's got to be great. Logically, people think, well, you know, he's the only one that offers a guarantee. I mean, this must be a pretty good product, otherwise he would have gone broke. And it says your company is really reputable. You know, no fly-by-night company is going to offer a money-back guarantee, right? So you see, it's only a couple of words, but it actually says so much that an ad can't really say because people are suspicious of jargon. But when they hear offer a guarantee, it means so much. And you know what? Most people are honest. Most people don't ring up and say, listen, give me my money back. You know, even if they're dissatisfied, they just don't want the hassle. Truly. Hardly any. And the numbers that you'll get will be far greater, even if a few do. And finally, if you still say, I can't possibly offer a money back guarantee because everybody will want their money back, you've got to ask yourself morally, are you selling the right product that you're so fearful of doing that? Now, of course, it can be conditional. You can put the, the right kind of conditions, but unconditional work best. Finally, test everything. A guy called Lord Leverhulme said, he said, I know half the money I spend on advertising is wasted. Trouble is, I don't know which half. And a lot of people are like that. There are people in this room that literally have spent 15 years putting ads in papers and they're not sure whether they, they're not sure they get one customer from it. And you can't blame them because they're not aware of different methods to test. But it's actually not that hard. In fact, it's really easy. All you do is create testing systems. For instance, Whenever someone rings up, you help them with their inquiry, and at the end, someone says, and where'd you hear about us? You've heard people doing that. And you've just got a photostatted pad, and you just tick yellow pages, or I heard from your press ad, or you drop some coupons in my mailbox, or something like that. And you can test your coupons, even. You know, you, all you have to do there is you put an A in one little coupon that you send with one offer into mailboxes, and then you put a B with a totally different offer that you drop in, in other places. And at the end of the day, you might see, ah, oh, I see a month later I get 70% bees back. Well, that's a better proposition. Or maybe that's an area that prefers my product. So slowly but surely, you refine everything down. And so that, you know, a year and a half later, you precisely know where your money should be spent, whether you should put it in the trade newspapers or the other newspapers or take it out of this, put it into that. And you know which propositions are the best, which are the best offers. And this is something you can use for the next 20 years to make more money than the competition because they don't do this testing system. And you'd be amazed how even different headlines can get massively different results, even just two words different. I'll give you a classic example of how tiny word changes can completely alter the power of communication. It's a story about a copywriter who had to work, uh, walk across a park every day to get to work. And there was this blind man begging with a hat, sign, begging just near a tree, right? And he got to know him. Uh, over the days and, and nights, the copywriter would walk in in the morning, say good day to the blind man. In the evenings, he'd say good day to him. And they, you know, the blind man got to know his voice. They'd have a chat occasionally. And this went on for some months. And one day, the copywriter walked past in the morning, said good day. But this time, he knelt down and he wrote something on the blind man's sign, headed off to work. And that evening, he walked past, said good day to the blind man, and as soon as the blind man heard his voice, he said, stop, stop, sir. He said, for eight years, I have been sitting in this park begging. And every day, at the end of each day, I'd only ever have a few coins in my hat. But now my hat is overflowing. Tell me, what did you write on my sign? And the copywriter said, well, look, I hardly changed it at all. Your sign used to say, I am blind. I just changed it to, it is spring and I am blind. It's the power, tiny word change can make to impact. We must test everything. So there are a whole lot of ways that you can increase your profitability and they're proven through marketing and advertising no matter how small your business is, whether you're an individual or corporation. 
And what I was supposed to do was talk in you know, the last 15 minutes or so about personal marketing, you know, about wearing the right time, presentation and stuff. As you can see, I fail. But what I thought I'd do, really, is get to the heart of personal marketing. And I honestly believe this, that it's about long-term relationships. And the, the crucial foundation stone of long-term relationships when it comes to marketing is personal integrity. See, people aren't stupid. They know when someone's being slick. They know when you know, they're not getting the entire truth, when the person's not really looking them in the eye. And sure, they might put up with it with a thousand different salesmen on small items. But for repeat sales, it's so often, apart from everything else, it's the personal integrity and image of the guy or girl you're dealing with. And I think that's a matter of character. I combine that with the fact that for the last 13 years, my hobby, one of my primary hobbies anyway, has been investigating successful people of all different areas. And I've been very fortunate being in advertising because we get to meet the heads of, of companies. They, they want to deal with, with advertising themselves. So I've spent time with you know, everyone, from the richest man in Australia and his son downwards. And I've learned an incredible thing for me, and I, I hope it's of, of benefit for you. No matter what area they're in, whether top sportsmen, top philanthropists, top housewives, or top business people, successful people all share four characteristics. And I go so far as to say that if you don't develop them, it's almost impossible to be successful. And it is a matter of developing them, working on them. By the same token, if you do, I honestly believe no matter what area you're in, it is virtually impossible not to be successful. So what are the four characteristics of all successful people? First of all, successful people knock, 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 knock on doors until they open. There's a huge myth about successful people shared by failures. And that is that they just lucked out, that they were just lucky in the right place at the right time. It's never the case. Trouble is, a lot of the successful people try and give the impression it is. But you look into their histories and you just see failure after failure after failure. Truly, successful people fail more than failures. Successful people fail more than failures. They just don't stop. Second characteristic of all successful people is belief. Anyone work, uh, read the works of Deepak Chopra? Yeah, quite a few. He's a fantastic mind-body expert from the States. He's got some great facts in his books. For instance, the average person thinks between 60 and 75,000 thoughts a day. That's pretty amazing. But even more incredible is this. Around 70% of them are the same thoughts you had yesterday. Thoughts like, bitch. <laughs> Stuff like that. You know, and finally, they, you keep on having them until finally these, these beliefs, these thoughts, become like they're real. And you act like they're so. And it's as if they're so. It's, you can't imagine the awesome power they found out that belief, our beliefs, are having on both our mentality and even on our body. How many of our beliefs are killing us? In so many ways. Beliefs about what we're capable of. Beliefs about what people think of us. Beliefs about what that person really is. We act like it's true and it becomes true. We must guard our beliefs. And all successful people have often subconscious mechanisms for doing that. So I'd like to give you a very quick way of doing that, uh, uh, to guard your beliefs. Very, very easy. Literally, you just write down five beliefs you'd like to have. Because they've just been pre-programmed in the past by, by various circumstances. So this time you choose five beliefs I'd like to have about myself. I get on well with people. I earn this amount per year in the present tense. Then every morning and every evening, you just look in the mirror and you say it like you mean it. And you spend two minutes a day visualizing. That's it, just watching a movie of your success. Almost all top sportsmen do visualization. In fact, the reason the, uh, said by the Americans that the communists, um, apart from drugs, dominated in the 70s and 80s in the Olympics was because they started about 15 years before the Americans to do visualization. Because the brain's 88% subconscious, you can train it and you become what you think about most of all. The third characteristic of all successful people is vision. Do you think exactly like everybody else? You have a lot of friends, but you're unlikely to become super successful simply because 
most people aren't successful. And I made no judgment on that. You know, when it comes to material success anyway, you know, there's a hell of a lot of things you can be doing that are a lot better than going to work. Spending time with your kids, with your family, have, leading a balanced life, staying healthy. I don't for one second want to say that you should be focusing on material wealth. However, if you have elected to focus on material wealth or that you believe that you want greater material wealth than you have or you want to achieve true greatness in any area of, area of life, then to think like other people is suicide. Because most people are mediocre. They are the medium by its very nature. So if you head off in another area, an area of greatness, it's almost certain that people are going to slam you. And it's been so throughout history. Albert Einstein said, great spirits have always encountered violent opposition from mediocre minds. Great spirits have always encountered violent opposition from mediocre minds. And ain't it the truth? But we act like something strange when someone slams us for it. It's probably an indication we're going somewhere special. And the worst thing is, often these are people who love you and they don't want to see you hurt. But even if you're the only person on earth that believes you're right, you must go ahead. And it, it doesn't mean you're dogmatic, that you don't listen. Absolutely you listen. But you must power ahead because most people don't know. Vision. The final characteristic of all successful people is action. I'm going to say something now that it's going to sound really glib, but I need you to hear it. To be great, your actions must be great. To be great, your actions must be great. And you go, oh, that's really obvious. But the world's full of people who think they're going to be great. But everybody else in the office knows they're not. Or people who think they're going to be great and they're doing exactly the same thing day to day as what the failures in the next room are doing. And of course, all of a sudden, you know, when they're 75, they realize they ain't going to make it. It's devastating. And they don't have references like Colonel Sanders, you know, about people who literally started their whole lives when they retired. It's the stuff of divorces, it's the stuff of, of heart attacks, it's the stuff of pain. And it starts because people aren't guarding their individual daily actions. I mean, everybody learned it who did physics. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. If it's true for everything in the universe, might it just be true for us? And you look at great people, and there's always great actions before they became famous. Persistence, belief, vision, action. Get one of them right, and you'll be more successful than most people. Get all of them right, and you will live a life that people write books about. And you deserve it. In the words of Nelson Mandela, in his 1994 inaugural speech, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented and fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small doesn't serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It is not just within some of us. It's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Thank you. Simon Reynolds. Bob Pritchard was described by Marketing Magazine as Australia's international marketing authority. He was the man Kerry Packer turned to to market World Series cricket. He also handled the marketing of the inaugural Formula One Grand Prix in Adelaide. 
the international telecast of the Skins Golf, with four of the all-time greats, Norman, Nicholas, Ballesteros and Watson. This was followed by what the Sun Herald described as the most successful marketing story ever. It's turning around of the Sydney Swans, where in just one season, the Swans attendances increased from 7,000 to 40,000. His efforts with the America's Cup brought accolades from around the world. Except he created and implemented only the third the international Sun marketing Sun program involving sport in Coca-Cola's 107 year history. And now, the excitement and celebration of 100 years of American movies has been placed in the very capable hands of Bob Pritchard. The first time all the major film studios have worked together on a project. An extraordinary achievement for an Australian. Some of his other clients include General Motors, World Heavyweight Champion Evander Holyfield, Olympian Katarina Vitt, American Express, Ford Motor Company, AT&T, Bank of America and Anheuser-Busch to name a few. A truly groundbreaking Australian marketer, please welcome to the stage the CEO of Pritchard Marketing, Mr. Bob Pritchard. Good afternoon. Wow, what a week. My client Evander Holyfield got out there, showed him. He did what everybody said was impossible, what couldn't be done. And the reason he did it was because he studied Mike Tyson, every fight, every move. He studied his competition day in, day out. When I very first met Evander at my house about five or six years ago, he sat down and he said, I can beat Tyson. I know exactly what he's going to do and I know exactly when he's going to do it. And so when he stepped into the ring, I had no doubt that he was going to beat Mike Tyson. If you study your competition and you keep learning your own craft, you'll always win. You'll always win. It's when you stop learning that you stop winning. Something I'd like to say just to, to open and to bear in mind as we talk through this afternoon. When you're not learning, someone somewhere else is. And when you two meet, if they know more than you do, they'll win. So it's critical to continue to learn. And looking out here today, I, um, it reminds me of me many, many, many times over the years going to seminar after seminar after seminar because I realised that I can't learn by my mistakes because there's just too much to do. There's too many mistakes you can make. It's much better to take all the knowledge of all the people that have gone before you and been successful and utilising that knowledge for your own gains. So you've got to keep learning. I was thinking about what, what was it in my past? I started pretty humbly in Richmond in Victoria. And what was it that changed my life that got me to where I am? And it's very hard to put your finger on it. But what I have continued to do is learn, day in, day out. Every day at Pritchard Marketing, at 8 o'clock in the morning, we have a learning session. All the staff get together and we watch videos, we listen to tapes, we go through books, summaries, we talk about new things that are happening every single day. We never ever miss. And we include everybody. We include receptionists, everybody that works in the place. It's not compulsory. I do remember who doesn't turn up. But it's not compulsory. And it's amazing how much we all learn. All my staff say, this is a fantastic learning curve. Even people who might be hired just to answer the telephone. Say, so since I've been here, I've learned just such a tremendous amount about everything. And it makes our communication with our clients just so much better. So today, it's not just enough to come along here and listen to us and say, wow, that's pretty good. Taking a few notes go back to the office this afternoon or tomorrow morning, feel really excited, then get bogged down in the same old things and by tomorrow afternoon, you're back to your old habits. 
You have to be different to succeed in this world. You have to go the little bit extra. You have to do things that other people won't do. Just going back to the same old routine simply won't cut it. The average Fortune 500 CEO reads 20 non-fiction books a year. The average person reads none. The average Fortune 500 CEO earns 20 times what the average person earns. There's a direct correlation between the amount of knowledge that you gain and the amount of income that you can earn. But you have to keep learning. We've got uh, quite a lot of runs on the board with big companies and with small companies. And we follow the same 15 keys working with everybody. Doesn't matter whether it's a Coca-Cola or whether it's a small product, whether it's a service, doesn't matter who it is. The same 15 keys apply. And I'm going to run through some of those with you today. Marketing's not complicated. It's simple. It's logical. But you do have to apply a lot of thinking power to it. Anybody here who thinks that their advertising and marketing over the last 12 months has been absolutely spot on perfect? Anybody? You wouldn't be here, I guess, would you? Anybody think they've wasted less than half of it? A few. A few. That's great. Most people waste most of it. Why is that? We're pretty intelligent. We know our business. We use consultants, advertising agencies, and yet we still waste such a large amount of the money we spend on marketing. We don't seem to do anything about it. We just sort of accept it. If anybody on your staff didn't perform 50% of the time, what would you do? Get rid of them. But we tolerate average marketing. So why is it that the things that we've done in the past don't work anymore? The traditional methods of marketing, advertising, promotion, they just don't work anymore. The reason is that in the last 10 years we've gone through a greater change than we have in any other 50 years in history. The world has changed dramatically. It's changed technologically. 10 years ago, think back, very few people had mobile phones or faxes. Now, a piece of software is outdated before you even get it home. The new Mercedes-Benz has more computer power than the Apollo spaceship that took man to the moon. Think about that. It's remarkable. Think about corporations. Corporations, the pyramid structure that corporations have, have had for donkey's years. Been huge restructuring over the last 10 years. Middle management, the guys on the dole lines all over the world are mini, middle management. People who thought they were secure forever. Because companies have got much more consumer responsive. Doesn't matter what part of the company you're in, you have to be more in tune with the marketplace today. What has that done? the consumer. The consumer is more cynical than they were before. They're more insecure than they ever have been. Every time you see a consumer survey, you hear people saying, I'm worried about the future, even though they've been the same job for 20 years. They're worried about their kids' future. They're much more discerning about what information they take in and what advertising they listen to. It's a different ball game, and it's happened very quickly, and it's going to continue to accelerate. So how do we... Anybody here play golf? A few golfers around? Well, marketing is a bit like playing golf. Would you agree with me that anybody can hit a ball? You put a ball there and you can whack it, right? Anybody can do that? The tricky part about playing golf is getting the ball in the bloody hole. That's the hard part. And to do that, you've got to get a whole bunch of things all going right. Anybody catch? Could Probably over there. <laughs> you've got to get a whole bunch of things all happening at the same time, just right, 
to get the ball in the hole. Marketing's exactly the same. There's a whole lot of things you have to do, and if you don't do them in the right sequence, at the right time, your marketing won't work. This ball, I had this ball signed by Jack Nicholas. It's true. It's a real, real ball. I'll try this. <laughs> it's worth about a thousand bucks, so whoever catches it's got a good deal. Congratulations. Okay, what I'm going to do, I want to run through just some of the 15 keys that we use every day. And the first one is, sounds really corny, it sounds really dumb. But the first one is to know what business you're in. I was talking to somebody earlier and I said, what, what business are you in? And they said, I'm a chemist. And I said, yeah, but what business are you in? The guy said, I'm a chemist. Like, you're supposed to be so smart. What don't you understand about being a chemist? Well, that means that BBC Hardware or Mitre 10 are in the hardware business, right? No, they're not. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, today I have to buy a hammer. My big ambition today is to get myself a hammer. Nobody does that. Nobody's got all their marbles together. You get a hammer because your wife says, if you don't fix the bloody door, I'm going to get a tradesman. Your brain says, tradesman, 150 bucks an hour, I'll go buy a hammer. So you buy a hammer to solve a problem. We ran a series of ads a few years ago for a hardware company. One set of ads said, we have the widest range of screws and nails and hammers and all that stuff on the planet. In America, they do that. You know, It's almost compulsory to say, got the biggest range of everything in the world. And the second set of ads said, if you have a problem, we'll solve it. The ads that said we're in the problem-solving business outpulled the ads that said we're in the hardware business 900 to 1. Not in the hardware business at all, in the problem-solving business. A totally different business to be tackled in a totally different way. So until you know what business you're in, how are you ever going to sell your product to anybody? And 90% of people don't know what business they're in. And 90% of people don't succeed. Second key, once you know what business you're in, is to know what it is that you're selling. Now that sounds pretty corny too. But when a lady or myself goes and buys a jar of cosmetics, I put under my eyes each night so that I hide the fact that I was born in the 40s. Why do I buy it? Do I buy it because I want a jar of chemicals to put on my face? No. Hope is why I buy it. I hope it's going to get rid of the blemishes. I hope I'm going to look beautiful in the morning. And hope is a totally different product. So if you sell hope, you'll sell cosmetics. I drive a Mercedes-Benz. Why? Because I need a motor car. If I needed a motor car, I could have bought a second-hand Volkswagen. I didn't want a motor car. I was buying something totally different. I was buying Ego or Prestige or whatever it was I was buying, but I certainly wasn't buying a motor car. People never, ever buy the product. People only ever buy the emotional benefit that comes from the product. The product's something you walk out of the store with. What you actually buy is something totally different. And yet, have a look around you. Everywhere you go, what do you see? People advertising products. Every billboard, every ad, it's about products. And yet, nobody wants products. So why the hell do we go out and advertise something that nobody wants and expect to be successful? And then we turn around and say, I wonder why 95% of our advertising doesn't work. Because 95% of us are advertising products that people don't want to buy. So you need to find out what it is that people are really buying when they look at your product. 
The third key, and this one's very important, I believe, is empathy. Being empathetic is critical to success. And I think success these days is about a well-rounded existence. It's about having being successful in your relationships, being successful with your kids, having empathy with your kids, with your workmates, having a nice cohesive team that all works together. And it's amazing how many companies don't have that, don't have that wonderful teamwork ethic. And all it takes is empathy. And too many of us, too often, assume to know what other people are thinking. And we don't take into account what they're thinking. And until you can understand what it is that the people that you work with and the people that you deal with and the people that you live with understand and go through, you're not going to be successful. So you need to have that empathy. A couple of years ago, I did the smartest thing I've ever done. And that was to appoint a lady, Janice Loveland, as president of my company. Women are much more empathetic than men are. Much more. And I've found that since Janice has been in charge, the company runs better. The harmony within the company is fantastic. Our relationships with our customers is better. The campaigns and the things we create are better because we've got a very strong female perspective, not only from Janice, but some, from some other people we brought into creative. And it really has made a difference. So any of you that have companies that are out there dealing with the public and trying to sell people things, I urge you to bring women into that process and give them more say and listen to them because it really will change the way you approach business. And in the next 20 years, that's going to be very important. Key number four is to create brand awareness. Now, when we're exposed to an ad, 99.9% of the time, we're not the least bit interested in buying that product right then and there. But because we're consumers, sooner or later, we're going to buy it. But we buy in a generic sense. We don't sit there usually and think of a brand. We think of the product and then we look up the yellow pages or we do whatever we do. For you to be successful, you have to have people think about your brand. I'll show you how powerful that is. I'm just going to run through a couple of generic products and you just pretend that you need them right now. And think of who you'd call. Fresh fruit and vegetables. Mobile phone. Takeaway pizza. Everybody in this room thought of the same one or two companies. Just came to mind. Now, if you were in the business competing against them, how would you like everybody out there to think of them before you? What chance do you think you'd have of getting their business? Makes it hard, doesn't it? Because they're going to think of them and go to them first. So unless you can cut through that and get front of mind recall, you're not going to be successful. How many of you out there believe that if you were up here and you said, whatever your brand is, how many people out there do you think would think of your brand first? Very few, probably. And you can't compensate for that by good brochures or yellow page ads. People say, oh, I've got a wonderful brochure. That's beaut. You send it to somebody. They probably don't want to buy your product right now. So what do they do? They file it. Where do they file it? With all your competitors. So when they want to buy your product or the product that you make, they go to the file, pull out all your competitors. Isn't that just where you want to be? So your brochure, your brochure might be as good as you can make it, but you don't get the call because they've got a better brochure. Or yellow pages. You should certainly have a great Yellow Pages ad. But a lot of people just do that. That's all they do. People send, look us up in the Yellow Pages. What a brilliant idea that is. 
There's 10 pages of your competition right there and you just told them to go and look them up. Brilliant. You have got to distinguish yourself. You've got to make your name come into people's minds first because if you don't, you're way behind the eight ball before you start. How do you do that? Well, you do it with a thing called a unique selling proposition or a customer purchasing benefit, which I'll talk about in a minute. But you can't just sit back and produce brochures and yellow page ads because you will not succeed. Consumer purchasing benefit, or a USP. What it is, I prefer actually, a lot of people talk about unique selling propositions, but that infers it's about the seller, where in fact every purchase is actually about the buyer. So I prefer to use consumer purchasing benefit because that talks about the buyer. And what it is, it's a distillation into a few words of the major advantage your product has over your competitor. So that you trigger that recall. And you use this USP, or consumer purchasing benefit, in every single thing you do. You put it on your letterhead, you put it on every piece of paper, every ad, every message that goes out there. How powerful is it? Well, my most favourite example is Domino's Pizza. Domino's Pizza is in the most competitive business in the world. In America, in every suburb, there is 50 takeout food places. They're everywhere. And they're all competing on price. Every single one of them is out there saying, $5.95 and I'll throw in an extra dessert. $5.95 and we'll throw in coffee. And it's a totally price-driven exercise. What Domino's did, they went out and they spoke to people right across America and they said, when you buy takeout food, what is it that you're looking for? What's the most important thing? And people said, we want to get it quickly. We don't want to have people complaining that they're hungry. We want to order it and have it delivered pretty quick. So Domino's went out and said, 30 minutes or it's free. What does that say? Get it quick. What happened? They went from a small, local, domestic takeaway place to the biggest takeout food company in the world. What did they do at the same time that they changed their USP? They put their prices up. So they got out of this $5.95 double pizzas, extra toppings, got out of all that. They didn't promise you a great pizza, they didn't promise you a hot pizza, they didn't promise you a pizza at all. All they said was you get it in half an hour or it's free. And business went through the roof and they got out of the price cutting business. And that's what we all have to do because we tend to price cut. What does price cut cutting do? Cuts our margins. When we cut our margins, we make less profit. We don't have the ability to advertise as much. We can't promote our product as much. We end up going broke. It doesn't seem like a great philosophy to me. There's a hole in that somewhere. People say to me all the time, but that's all right, they're big companies, or I'm a little company, or I'm a different kind of company, you don't understand. Well, it works for everybody. You don't have to be big. And everybody should have a USP. And if you don't have one, I'll go as far as to say, if you don't have a good USP, you'll probably go out of business. It's that powerful. And it doesn't have to be real. It just has to trigger the purchaser's imagination. For example, Nescafe. Conversations just flow with Nescafe. What does that mean? If you have a cup of Nescafe, does it make you talk better? No. Wash your clothes whiter than white with Rinso. Whiter than white? 
God, maybe. What does that mean? But what happened was, people said, I really have to have this shirt really white, so this is as white as it can get, so I'll buy the product. At Pritchard, we say, when you're serious about being successful, come to us. When you think about it, it says a whole bunch of things in just a few words. And we have it on absolutely everything we do. So it keeps getting out there. And it's very important. The next key is your name and image of your company. We have lots of people say to us, oh yeah, but the name doesn't really matter if the product's great. Well, it's an incredibly competitive world out there. And often, people are sitting there looking at a couple of products and there's not much difference between them, if any. And your name can make such a huge difference. Anybody been to the Bronx? Couple. How appealing does Bronx ice cream sound here? You get one of those coupons, you buy six, they give you a gun and a couple of bullets. It's great. Change the name to Hagen does. What happens? Sells all over the world. All of a sudden, it's inviting. It's different. Sounds great. Sounds Scandinavian. You take um, Clinique. Another example. The fashion capital of the world is Paris. Clinique is an American company. If they had an American name, would it be as successful? Probably not. Clinique's got that French mystery about it. So it really works for the product. We have people come to us all the time and they've got, no, it doesn't matter what it is, but they make widgets. And they come in and you say, what's the name of the company? And they say, Dojan. And you say, oh, beaut. Um, where did Dojan come from? Well, I'm Doug, my wife's name's Jan. And we thought Dojan was pretty cool. So they're out there looking for a job. A company's looking at two products. They're both widgets. One company's called the Fantastic Widget Company, and the other's called Dojan. Which one are you going to buy? People are going to buy from the Fantastic Widget Company. Every time. Image and colour and the excitement of your name and your logo is critical to your business. Different colours work in different ways. You can put energy into a logo. You can put energy into a look. How often do you get something from a bank that's in purple or orange or something? They're always green and blue. You can trust us with your money. As soon as they sent you something in purple, you wouldn't give them a cracker. But people do it all the time. People do not think hard enough and long enough about what it is that they're selling or how they're communicating the message. Key number seven, it's not the product that gets people, it's the offer. It's not the product, it's the offer. You need to test advertising. You need to test it and test it and test it. Get all your competitors' ads, same as we did with the catering company. Get all your competitors' ads and look at them. See what they're offering and be better. You have to be better than your competitors' ads. If you go to a tailor, and you've been going to the same tailor for 10 years, and you're very happy with it, they always make things that make you look great. What's it going to take for me, if I'm a tailor up the road, to get you to switch from somebody you're happy with? Are you going to switch for 10%? No. Are you going to switch for 20%? Probably not. You're going to need a really compelling reason to change from somebody that you're happy with. So just putting an ad together isn't enough. You have to put the best ad together. It has to be better than anything your competitors are doing or you're just wasting your time. How often do we throw something together at the last minute because there's a deadline? All we're doing is wasting our money. You're better off not advertising. Get out there, check it, check it, check it, check it. Make sure that it's better than the opposition. Make sure that the verbiage you use is appealing to whoever your target market is. So many of us continually write ads 
in the way we speak and we think. And yet, if you talk to kids today, they've got a language all of their own. They think differently. They speak differently. Different words turn them on than, than we're used to. You write an ad differently for a woman than you do for a guy. And yet, most of us, if we're guys, write the ads, we don't care who it's aimed at. We don't do enough research. Little things like, how often do you see half price in an ad? It could be half price, two for the price of one, 50% off, buy one, get one free. They all say exactly the same thing. But buy one, get one free is so much more powerful because there's something about free that gets people. And yet, 50% off is used much more than buy one, get one free. You really have to look at it and re-verbalise what you're saying until you come up with the perfect ad. Key number eight, risk reversal. At the point of buying something, people are getting increasingly apprehensive. They think, what if it's not a great deal? What if it falls apart? Do I really need it? Can I really afford it? And all those things are going through their mind. You have to get past that to make a sale. How do you do that? Well, the dealer, car dealer up the road from my office in Santa Monica has a deal where if you can find the car cheaper somewhere else, he'll give you four times the difference. Four times. So when somebody is making a decision on a car, why not buy it there? Because any time you find it cheaper, I'll gladly give you the difference. What happens? I said to him, how long have you been running this? He said, four years. I said, how many times have you had to refund money? None. Because what happens? You get in the car, you drive it home, your spouse says, wow, I love the new car. Your kids say, oh, this is really cool. Your neighbours compliment you on the new car. What are you going to do? Spend the rest of your life driving around, going to car yards, seeing if you can rip this black out of a few bucks? Of course you're not. But you've made him commit to buying the car, he or she, make, to commit to buying the car now. Testimonials are powerful. If you put in an ad, um, we'll give you a list of people you can call and ask. It's very strong because they feel that if you've got that much confidence in your product, then they can buy it. Next key is to sell benefits. Nobody ever buys features. Nobody. And yet have a look around you. People are always out there selling features. I was flicking through the yellow pages the other day. I saw this ad for a hairdressing salon. And it said, eight chairs. I've only got one bum. Eight chairs. What the hell is that supposed to mean? You have to sell benefits. How do you determine what a benefit is? If you can't say, so what, at the end of the statement, it's a benefit. If you can say, so what, it's a feature. It's very simple. Car companies love saying, we've spent 2.5 million developing this butte chair for the front seat of your car. So what? What does that do for me? But if they said, we've spent two and a half million developing this great chair that every 15 seconds sends this electrical impulse through, straightens up your back, makes you feel alive, and every three minutes gives you an orgasm, I'm in! You'd buy it, wouldn't you, in a minute? It's a benefit. All of a sudden, it becomes exciting. But so many people, have a look around you, so many people are out there saying, features, 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 and nobody cares about features. Next key is to add value and give people awesome service. Give them better service than they can possibly imagine. A lot of people sit there and say, ask them why you should buy from them and they'll say, because we give great service. Like that's a benefit? 
when I pay somebody money. I expect a great product. I expect great service. That's what the hell I'm paying for. It's not a benefit. It's not great service to give somebody great service. You've got to go out of your way to give more service. When I buy my shoes, a week later I get a note saying, thank you very much for coming in and buying shoes. We really appreciate your custom. Within two weeks, somebody turns up in my office and polishes them for me. And they probably polished 50 other pairs of shoes that day. How much does that cost the guy selling the shoes? Not much. Where am I going to go and buy my next shoes? I'm going to buy them there. Why would I change? Great service makes a hell of a difference. Key number 11. Cut through the clutter. Think outside the square. Do something different. Very competitive out there. Getting more and more competitive. Newspapers, there seems to be more and more ads in them. There's more television stations running more ads. There's more ads everywhere. How do you cut through the clutter and do it simply? Most of us don't have big budgets. So we have to make our little budget compete against the guys that have got big budgets. And that's hard. So we have to think of doing things differently. I was sitting in LA a couple of weeks ago watching television. I'd been out. It's 1 o'clock in the morning. And an ad comes on television and it says, Are you an alcoholic? Phone 213, whatever the number was. So I picked up the phone, dialed the number, and it said, John's Liquor Store. <laughs> That's true. How many people call? Probably not many. But what happens? I'm talking about it. You now all know about it. You're a long way from this liquor store. But in America, I'm sure the same, there's people like me talking about it all over the place. So the word's getting spread. You tell your friends about it. He's buying spots at 2 o'clock in the morning and probably cost him 50 bucks. And he's got everybody on the planet talking about his ads. He hasn't even got any pictures. He's just got a sign. Are you an alcoholic? Cost him six, sixpence halfpenny to produce the thing. It's, that's what counts, doing something different. And if you think about things and think it through, think about who your target market is, it's amazing what you can achieve. I'm going to stop with the keys because I've run out of time, but I just want to say one more thing that's really, really important. And that is you have to persevere. So often you think, why am I doing this? Running your own business is really hard. Getting up that corporate ladder is really hard. There's better things to do with your life. Well, after I'd been in America for about four years, I'd found it unbelievably competitive. And after four years in the States, I was broke. And I probably had $120,000 on credit cards. And I'm sure lots of people have been in that position. It's a terrifying position to be in. And we'd pitched for a big job in New York, about a $20 million job, and we had an interview on the Wednesday to present our idea. On the Sunday prior to the Wednesday, I had a really bad accident and almost severed my left leg. They picked me up and they took me to UCLA Medical Center where they said, we've got to operate right now because we've got to connect a lot of the bits back that if we don't connect immediately, you're not going to work anymore and you'll have a stiff leg. So I said, is there any way we can kind of patch it until Thursday? I don't care what you do to it, just let me get through Thursday because if not, I'm going to go broke. And they said, it's up to you. It's either no leg and wait till Thursday or have it done now. Get yourself a new life. Wasn't a great choice, really. So I let them operate. So I wake up on Tuesday and I'm in the hospital bed and I've got my leg up in this thing. You know, it's like, it's up here somewhere. And I've got drips coming out of everywhere and I've got one of those ridiculous gowns on that every time you move something else falls out. You know those gowns? And I look terrible, I haven't shaved for three days. And I've got full of morphine and, you know, 
Things are pretty cool. And one of my guys came in and said, what are we going to do about this presentation tomorrow? And I said, mate, forget about it. It's over. I can't afford it. It's gone. So they said, no, it's not. Come on, let's do it. Let's do it by teleconference. I said, I don't have any money. I just can't afford to do it. I don't have a dime. So they said, we'll fix the money. So my staff went out and raised the money. They got on their own credit cards. They did all sorts of things to get the money together. The next day, we had a teleconference to New York. So I'm in hospital, legs up in the stirrup. I look dreadful, drips everywhere, and I'm giving this presentation to this board. I can't imagine what they must have thought. And we got the bloody job. Couldn't believe it. I said to the marketing director after it, you know, I just find it's amazing to me that you gave us the job. And he said, you gave me the job for two reasons. Firstly, we thought the idea was great. Secondly, you went to so much trouble to present it that we felt that if you went to that much trouble to get it across, you would go to that much trouble to implement it. And we feel pretty comfortable with that. So we got the job. So I could have been now back working for somebody, doing something totally different. But because we persevered, because we kept going, because we did things that a lot of people maybe wouldn't have done, maybe they wouldn't, we're here. And business has been fantastic ever since. When we got notified that we were selected to um, do the marketing for 100 years of American movies, when we sat there and looked at the talent that's in the American movie companies, it's extraordinary. <coughs> And it was this amazing feeling, the most humbling feeling you could ever feel to think an Australian company got something that's that prestigious. We got it because, thank you, but we got it because we went that extra yard and we've always gone that extra yard and we've kept learning. Every day we learn. Every day I learn more than I did yesterday. When I travel on aeroplanes, I listen, I read, all the time. Because when you're not learning, someone else is. And when the two of you meet, if they know more than you do, they'll win. And it's a hell of a lot better up there than it is down there. It's worth that little bit of extra effort. Thanks very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Bob Pritchard. Australia has produced many champions. You are about to meet one of our champions of business, Brad Cooper. From a humble beginning in the suburbs of Melbourne, Brad has risen to managing and owning major shareholdings in companies that now turn over a quarter of a billion dollars each year. Brad comes from a poor background. After leaving school at 13 years of age, he obviously had few prospects ahead. He is now described as a business phenomenon. Just four years ago, he was losing $200,000 each month with FAI Home Security. He has single-handedly turned his company around and grown from two staff to over 800, from zero to $120 million per year. Sales are up a staggering 12,000%. And the company now has outlets throughout Australia, New Zealand, Europe, and North America. But it has not always been easy. It's never peaches and cream, and, 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 it's, and it's understanding that failure is not this great big bad thing. That No book starts on page one. Here is a story of a great success man. And then every other page in the 400 page book is how wonderful life was. Blood and guts and failure is part of the deal. Pitted against America's Fortune 500 companies, FAI Home Security shines through as the third fastest growing company in the world. The amazing side to this story is that he sells only one product, a portable alarm system. He has turned a small Australian security company into one of the largest suppliers of home security systems in the world. A truly remarkable feat. He is the major shareholder and chairman of Rossignol Australia, the world's premier supplier of ski equipment. Rossignol Australia also supply the world famous Mambo ski wear and Land Rover camping equipment. Brad is also the major shareholder in Laura Star, the world's most successful home ironing system. He has recently secured the Australian rights and is now chairman and the major shareholder in Thomas the Tank theme products. 
In addition to his business portfolio, he is a director of the Elizabethan Theatre Trust, of which Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth is patron. Brandt's incredible success through the use of exceptional customer service, staff empowerment and the added value concept is now recognized internationally, not only by corporates but world business experts Tom Peters and Tony Robbins are speaking of Brad Cooper's Australian security company as part of their message around the world. Australian companies like Westpac, MLC, AMP, National Mutual, Colonial Mutual, PepsiCo, McDonald's, KFC, Weller, Prudential and LJ Hooker, to name a few, are all lining up to hear the Brad Cooper story and to implement his techniques into their company cultures. He is a motivator to the sporting stars and he is now undoubtedly Australia's most in-demand business speaker who has in the last 18 months reached a staggering 140,000 business people with his message of added value. Business is about magic moments. It's not a big ruthless world out there. What can you do today to go back and start to tantalise your service, your products. None of this happened overnight. You are about to experience a man who through sheer persistence, passion, belief and integrity has built a business empire from nothing. Now that he has achieved this success, he is sharing his winning message with you. Ladies and gentlemen, get ready. Open your minds to accept some new and outstanding business insights. If you implement some of what you are about to hear, your business will change forever. If you implement most of what you're about to hear, your business dreams will come true. Please welcome the Chairman of FAI Home Security, Mr. Brad Cooper. That's very kind and thank you and we're looking forward to having a little bit of fun here today. I just um, asked Mr. Bob Pritchard, I said, Bob, Tell me, um, how did you find the audience? He said, well, you know, I walked out, I stood about here, I looked up, and there they were. So that's my, uh, my colleagues adding value to me this afternoon. He said, you'll have to find out for yourself. Look, um, it's our pleasure to be here. We're going to have a little bit of fun, and we're going to make some nice, strong points that are going to impact you. There is a message in business, and that's a lovely video that you see up there. It gives a wonderful introduction, but... I, I would really like to share with you the other video which doesn't mention the things that go wrong and, and how you get over those hurdles and then importantly how you can add value and create some strategies that work. You're here today and I thank you and take that very seriously, the fact that you've turned up, the fact that you've given up an afternoon and an evening. You know, why did you come along? Because I go to seminars too and I go along expecting to learn something. So. I really take that extremely seriously and I have just been out the back thinking about what I'm going to say and how I'm going to best present and what I can hit you. I want to impact. If you're in the very back row today, my promise to you, I don't care where you're seated, you will not leave here without wonderful, strong, powerful, real ideas that increase your value in whatever you do. As in work, as in business, as in customer service, if you're a one-man band, Brian, if you're a one-man band or if you're a major operation, we're going to talk about some great success ideas. I, I have to go back a tiny bit to when I was 15, I left home. It says there I left school at 13, but I actually stopped going at 13. At 14, I left. I think you can work out the part in the middle. And with that, at 15, I left home and went to live in Perth, in Perth, Western Australia. I come from a, a home that was a very loving family, but very poor. I left and went to Perth and I worked for a man called Frank Harding. Frank Harding had a menswear store, but he did some stuff that has never happened before, during or probably after. Some simple things. And I have a business group today that does turn over a quarter of a billion dollars. I employ 1,100 people and I, I probably owe all my thanks to a couple of people and he's certainly one of them. One of the things that Frank did in the menswear shop we worked in is that Frank believed that if you went in to buy something, say if you went to buy a jacket, now we were called Frank Harding Exclusive Menswear, and as Frank Harding Exclusive Menswear, people would see that and assume that menswear meant anybody looking for menswear should go there. So what would happen is sometimes you would get a 65-year-old man come in and go, hey, mate, uh, got any cardigans? And exclusive menswear was meant to mean we're quite exclusive, it's expensive. 
So we would say, yes, sir, we do have a cardigan. Here's one here. And we would show the cardigan. And the person would go, 49 bucks, my bloody pension. And they'd take off. So we got to learn to be a little bit diplomatic. And you got to understand, never judge a book by its cover, but we actually got to understand that sometimes you had to be, you know, concerned for what people could afford. Now, if a person walked in and said, look, I need to buy, I'm looking for a, a cardigan. Sir, so, our cardigans are a little bit expensive. Let me show you one that you may like. Oh, no, that's way too expensive. Where would that customer normally then go if you didn't have what they wanted? Would they stay or leave? Leave. Not in Frank Harding's. Our job was to know, within a couple of kilometre radius, where they could probably best get served. So we would say, look, if, we, if you weren't busy, we would say, look, come with me, we'll go for a walk. What's your name? It's Derek. Hi, Derek, it's Brad Cooper. Let's go. And we would go for a walk. And we would walk down the Hay Street Mall. Some of you may have done that walk. Down to the Hay Street Mall, and we would walk them into a shop called Bones, which was like Myers and over in Perth. And we would say, um, in the menswear, Russell, because we would know Russell, because we know what Mr Harding made us do at lunch times. Get to know everybody. So we'd say, Russell, um, I've got a gentleman here, Derek. This is Russell. He's looking for a cardigan. And would you please be kind enough to give him the 10% discount that we've arranged? They would then shake hands and then I would leave. Now, who do you think that person would have a great deal of rapport for and feel good about? Now, that wasn't me. It was Frank Harding that made us do that. And you know what? We had a couple of guys that used to walk the people down to the shop and not speak to them. I was having to walk imbeciles. I don't want to spend any money. <laughs> that was their approach to it. And Frank gave us the option. He had that old, I can't do that these days, but Frank pulled us into the dressing room one day. Four of us in the dressing room was a bit tight. And he said, if I see one of you blokes ever, he said, I'll give you all a belt across the year old. If I ever, if I follow you and I see you walking like you look like your life's come to an end or you lost some money and you're not talking to that person, I'll give you a whack around the year old. Now get out there and serve the people. That was Frank's motivational chat to the staff. <laughs> so Frank Harding's silly little philosophies that that other guys wanted to turn around and walk down the street and walk down the street and go, you know, what the hell, mate? The bloke's not going to spend a cent, Frank. He's a desperate. Frank's view was everybody was a person and everyone should be treated like the first and last person you're ever going to serve in your life. And I have living proof that it works. Message is if we ended this thing right now, Frank said that service and good feelings and good, good goodness was Australian. And it was a boomerang and take the boomerang and throw as many out as you can because when you throw out the boomerangs, they come back. They come back in various forms and various shapes, but they come back. They really come back. And you can't throw enough boomerangs out. You just can't because, you know, it's feelings. You're helping people. All those little things that you throw out are going to make a huge difference to many people in their lives. Many people. And so we had a boomerang culture at Frank Harding's well before I'd ever heard the word added value. I had not heard the word service, culture, empowerment. All I had heard was that if you worked at Frank Harding, you did stuff, break windows, deliver at night. There was nothing. I remember once we drove to Kalgoorlie to deliver a guy his wallet back. It's an eight-hour drive out of Perth. There was no overnight couriers in those days. Some guy left his wallet behind. At Frank Harding's, I tell you what, the customer came first, customer came second, customer came third. And we had a little reunion last year with the guys that used to work at Frank Harding's. And you know what? The two of us, one of us and my other mate, we got cultured up. He owns four hi-fi shops and he's made himself a real nice damn living. I've done okay as well. And I tell you what, the other guys, we had a few beers with them, we had a lot of laughs, but they were the same then as they are now. What's in it for me? You know, why should I do that? Boomerang is what it's about. We live in Australia. We live in the greatest country in the world. I travel overseas 40 times a year. 40 different trips, long haul trips. And I come home to Australia and every time that plane touches down, as much as I love traveling, I tell you what, you may come here today and you may be searching for something. Let me tell you what you've already got in your own backyard. We live in the best country, and it's no secret, in the world. And people, four and a half billion, would give up 10 years of their life to swap it with you right now. They would give up 10 years of their life to have the warmth and the niceness and the hellos. I go, I go to England, I go to Manchester, I walk around the shopping centre at lunchtime. And I'm in Manchester and as I walk around the shopping centre, I go and buy my own little healthy sandwich and I wander around the centre and 
Some days, you know, you're on a different time frame and I'm in Manchester and I say hello to a couple of people. Probably wouldn't do it at home, just maybe a smile, but I'm over there, sandwich. Hello, how are you going? And it's like, something wrong with you. So I thought, that's a bit strange. She must be a bit think something's wrong with me. Look at her. So I started smiling at people and saying hello to people. I started actually doing it purposely. So I actually started going down to shopping centre at lunch times as a market search, research and smiling at people, saying hello, and nine out of ten in Manchester don't even smile back. They turn the other way. You see, what we take for granted here, we're rich. Bang smack in Australia. We are very, very rich. And so with that, how do we capitalise on all of that? Frank Harding's philosophy was very right for me. It was extremely right. Now that gave me the conviction to go into what business? Security. So I go to Newcastle and I open up a little home security company. Whereabouts do I open it? In Hunter Street, Newcastle. But I didn't have any money, so I had to work out of a coffee shop. So I'm in a coffee shop trading. Do you reckon that's a bit of a handicap having to interview people in a coffee shop? For nine weeks, six or nine weeks, is that a handicap, yes or no? No, it's not. No? Because if you've, got, if you've got a mission, you can hire in a telephone box. Because if people think you're going somewhere, you don't have to have any office. You can hire out in a car park. If you can walk in and say to someone, here's what we're doing, we had the ad in the paper, we asked the guy permission, could we put his phone number in? We asked permission, could we put the phone number in, take some calls, get some cappuccinos, lots of cappuccinos, lots of food, and we would be his best customer. And by the way, once we became established, all our, all our business would go his way. Now, I'm telling you, they're not always busy in coffee shops. And, and, and I basically used to hire people, and they, they would ring up and I'd say, I'd say, Oh, look, um, it's Bacardi's, yeah. Look, I can't hold the phone up, but the interview's at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, at 4 o'clock today. What time would you like? Yeah, I'd rather discuss that. What, yeah, it's a very personal interview. Uh, we're down at Bacardi's. Look, I won't meet you. Um, I'd like to meet you on the ground floor in the coffee shop. Tell me, how do you have your cappuccino? I'll make a note of that now. Great. Look forward to seeing you. Yeah, 5 0. Thank you. Boom. And then they'd come along, and they, you'd know who they were because they'd walk in like lost. And we would sit them down and I'd say, now look, thank you very much for coming in. I'll give you the good news. It's the good news. Firstly, you must have liked the ad to apply. Secondly, have you ever heard of a ground floor opportunity? This is the basement. You are so ahead of time here. Because I tell you what, in seven or eight weeks' time, when we're in our new office, you're in the basement. This is fantastic. And you know what? Conviction. What sells is conviction. Deep-seated conviction. That's what people buy. They don't care where they buy it, but that's what they buy. Why do all the new salespeople normally outsell all the experienced salespeople? Why do the people that know very little about the product sell a lot more than those that have been around a long time? Because what do you think the people that have been around a long time are carrying? Oh, yeah, but you can't sell that because that's got that. Oh, yeah, but if only you knew that. Yeah, but everyone in that market's seen that. Well, it's a bit tough out there because they've seen that and that makes it hard because of that. The new people don't know any of that stuff. They carry no luggage. So they're like, yabba dabba do, yabba dabba do, and they're out there with their case. And they're like, boom, 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 like, this is fantastic, you'll love it. What are people buying? They're buying the excitement. They're buying the spark. They are, people want to deal with people that are turned on. So if you're in a phone box and you say to someone, this is a wonderful thing, come in. This is close. This is very special. We're going to build something. Hey, BHP was once one seed, one person. You name me a company that started like big. How do you start? You start small. People respect that. People want to follow people who are going somewhere. People want to work for people who are going somewhere. People want to be led by someone, and even if you don't know where you're going, they want to think you do. You know the guy that actually said the world is round? Columbus said, come with me, boys. I'll take you and I'll show you the world's round. No one had ever been, ever been. And I tell you what, he's a great salesman. He convinced them to get in the boat. Well, a week into the, they've hit rough seas and they're all seasick. And they said, this idiot's going to take us off the edge of the world. The world's flat. And so they all got him. They're going to mutiny and string him up by the post. And you know what he said? Hey, I'm the only one that has belief that we're going to go. It's round. We're not going off the edge. I believe that. I can get you through. He's got a point there. And then they turned around and said, OK, well, you're the boss. And then they hit America. You know, conviction. He's the only one that had some conviction. People buy conviction. Major message. And if you haven't got conviction about what you're selling or what you're marketing, problem. Big problem. Because you ain't going to get there. You need to have that belief. And sometimes you've got to rebuild the belief. Strip it down and repackage it up. So I'm in Newcastle. And 
I trade there for three years. We opened up a few other offices around Australia, and basically it was a very hard time. And then I decide after three years I want to seek out and find a partner. A couple of reasons. I wanted to grow a bit bigger. I wanted to get some support. And I, I'm a bit opportunistic. I like to look for opportunities. And I know that you don't find them. You know they say opportunity knocks. <laughs> really? Have you ever found it come over, a little pecker comes to your home and gives you a little tap and says, here's opportunity, it's just coming in to get you. Do you reckon it's like, is it belting your door down, huh? Yes or no? no. I have found that the he who goes out and searches finds. And you know what? You want to make an omelette? You've got to crack a few eggs. You want to get some opportunities? You've got to go and kick down some doors. That's where opportunity lives, for those that kick down the doors. Kick down the doors and you get the opportunities. Amazing how they, they flow and they come and they, they arrive. You find them if you go looking for them, if you go looking for them. So I look for FAI, I spend seven months, seven long months. I go and do a number of presentations, and I must say a lot of them were very unsuccessful. Please let me give you the right story that most of them didn't work. I went, who in the room's got a Hills Hoist? Can I see hands for Hills Hoist? Well, Hills are a great Australian company. They had a great ad in. Hills looking for, they're looking for Australian products to be sold in the home. We are a security company selling alarms for the home. I went to Adelaide, did a 12-page report. I'm telling you, I, I didn't get laughed out of the boardroom, but I tell you what, it was as close to it as you just had. It, it was very unprofessional how I presented. And then I went to Wilson Parking. What are Wilson Parking famous for? Parking. But they said, synergy businesses. And my partner, David Appleby, said, what are you going to do? You're going to fly to Perth to a parking company? I said, yeah. I bought the ticket, 1800 bucks it cost me to get across there, within 24 hours, accommodation. I fly into Perth, and I, and I said, David, what do we do? He said, home security. I said, home, stroke, car security. He said, we're not in that business. I said, we are now that we're going to talk to Wilson Parking. We are going to be in that business. So I got some brochures on car alarms. We had almost got very good, almost, at selling home alarms. I go across to Wilson Parking, get across there, get in front of Laurie Wilson personally, and I do my presentation. And about 12 minutes into it, I, I started to explain all the background. And he said, oh, look, you obviously haven't been informed. This is a bit of a problem. Uh, I'm not sure what time is your time is at, but we, um, we, 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 we have a problem with car alarms. Is this the major part of your presentation, Mr. Cooper? Oh, yes, it is, Mr. Wilson. Well, you'll have to excuse yourself from the boardroom if you don't mind. And, and John, John Pierce, John will come and explain everything to you. As he suggested, I will leave the boardroom. I'm saying, but, 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 he said, no, Brad, you, you don't, perhaps, um, you perhaps shouldn't have flown across and been so quick to jump. We actually are thinking of taking an injunction out and stopping people with car alarms using our parking stations. <laughs> I'm sorry, I missed that part. Why would you be doing that? Well, because we have 50 or 60 false alarms a day. The acoustics send out loud noises. Shops are looking at taking an injunction out against us. And they're boycotting our parking. It's not, a, it's not a good time to mention car alarms. <laughs> it's a touch sensitive, but look, I hope you have a nice trip home, thank you. As, we landed, as, as I land in Adelaide, on the way back home, I ring David up with my partner. Hi David, how are you going? Oh, mate, well, but forget about how, how did you go? Well look, not exactly smashing. Um, will we do anything with them? Yeah, we'll probably never park with them ever again. <laughs> <laughs> and, that was, and that was it, you know, it didn't all work. But I get in front of FAI, Mr. Rod Adler. Larry Adler, the late Larry Adler, just passes away. Three and a half billion dollars, huge insurance company, number two in Australia at that time, number two. And I get in front of young Rod, and I get an hour, and I look at the BRW rich list, top 500, AA, Abels, Abels, well, he's doing well. Um, Adler, Ooh. Adler family, group wealth, 455 million. 1989, hang on, look at 88. 87, 1 billion, they're worth a billion, they've dropped half a bill. Share market crash. But he's worth 458 million. Of course, I'm in the Westpac Bank. I'm overdrawn. That's my scenario. <laughs> and subsequently, I go in, and long story cut short, a great meeting with Mr. Adler. At the very end of the meeting, Mr. Adler says, look, it's wonderful. I think it's exciting. Subject to due diligence, we'll do the deal, and shakes my hand. And it's 1.1 million that I get, 1.1 million that I get for half my company. I get to own half and get 1.1 million. Pretty big day from a kid from Northcote. 
And like I'm down in Macquarie Street, I walk out the door, I'm running down Macquarie Street, and you know the Toyota ads? I've redone the ads. I'm like down there, and I'm up in the air, and, I, and I'm like, I've, I'm gone nuts. My partner, I said, David, it's done. Well, it can't be done in an hour. I said, I'm telling it's done. Well, subject to what? Nothing. I said, it's just done some diligent stuff we have to do, but we're in. <laughs> well, 10 weeks later, anyway, it was a nightmare. I had to wait 10 weeks. The report, the accountant's report said flat no, complete no. The board said no. And as Mr. Adler said when he called me, he said, look, good news and bad news. What would you like? And I said, well, uh, we're bringing him the bad news. He said, well, the answer is flat no. For many reasons. The board said, no, we can't do it. Your report's bad. Your synergy's not like you said. Your, your computerisation is non-existent. You're a manual system. You haven't got a big enough customer base. And just so you know, Brad, we did spend $42,000. So we were serious about the report. But the answer's no. I'm telling you, you never had a gut wrench. You ever had just like that gut wrenching? Everything in your life just went that second. Well, what's the good news, Mr. Adler? He said, personally, I love it. Come in here right now and we'll do it. I've like nearly fainted. <laughs> and I want to I want to find it. Wouldn't you want to know why? Like I get there and I said, Mr. Could you just tell me, like, were you teasing me about the report? And he said, No, I'll give you a copy. It's a shocker. You are not worth a boat. <laughs> and I said, But why? But why? But why would you do it? He said, Look, I see reports every day. Who cares? Reports this, reports that. Essentially it says, don't do it. But it doesn't say there's anything bad about you or the company. There's nothing bad. And I, I just basically think that what people don't realise is, this kid's 28, right? What people don't realise is Reports this, reports that. How many good reports do you think I've seen where the report's great and the people are bad? I'm buying people. And essentially, I think your company's no good and I think you're very good and I think if you work hard, something might work. I said, I, take, I, I think you're a bit harsh on the company's no good. <laughs> he said, look, I don't care. I'm buying. Obviously, the report says don't buy the company. So what am I buying? I'm buying you. And he said, I see bad reports that turn out good and good reports that turn out bad. It's like relationships. They all kick off beautifully. Test of time. I think you're a good person. Let's go. And I got the money. I'm on the world trip first class with the champagne, as you would be if you did that happen to you. And like, I get back and I open up my new FAI company and I've been three weeks in America and you're up there on Qantas and they say, Mr. Cooper, would you like any more champagne? And I'm like, no, it's just wonderful. I'm fine. And the bank account looks great and I come back and I'm managing director of the new company, FAI Home Security. Well, for three years, it was a disaster. As managing director, you know what I hit? The eye of a, of a recession. Remember that recession? What were the interest rates then? How much? 18%. We were gone. I lost 200 grand, 150, 200, 200, 200. All my money went. Everything went. And you know what people admire? They admire it when someone's strong. So I used to go to work in the morning, and we had a disaster company. And I would go to work, and at work, I would take a deep breath in the car park, sometimes five or six, put all the little negatives behind, and I'd walk up that lift, morning, how are you going? Fantastic, they're going to have a great day. And we've been there working away. And I'm telling you, it was, I'm inside I was a bloody black cloud, worst nightmare, gut-wrenching, rock bottom. I fly to Melbourne, I say, Mum, I need to see you, 67 years of age. Mum, can I have a bit of a chat? I need to get you to mortgage the house. Oh, she said, well, that sounds a bit severe. Like, I've got... Money in the bank. I said, well, how much in the bank? He said, I've got my life savings, 18000 I said, well, I'm going to need that as well. <laughs> and I need you, Mum, if you could turn around to... Um, more. She said, well, look, but, but, darling, but you, Dad said never to let the house go. I said, Mum, he didn't mean that not to let me. He meant as a motherhood statement, hang on to the house. But essentially, I am here and I, 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 mean, I need help. And I, and I really need help and I'll never let you down. And Mum turned around and she said, well, okay... Tell you what, I need an hour, 24 hours to think about it. So I drove back to Tullamarine. 20, 30 minutes later, she calls me after I left the house. She said, I don't need the time to think about it. The answer's simple. If I say no to you, I will never forgive myself. I can live without the house, but I can't live in turning away my son. Anyway, it's a disaster. I reach rock bottom. A few mornings crying in the shower. You know that stuff. I get a bit of help along the way, and I... I get some help and Mr Adler essentially stands by me because he knew that my mother's house had been lost, he knew that my home was lost and he said, when you're fully committed, and you know the other thing why he helped me? Because everybody that he knew that was going broke was blaming what? The recession. He knew I never blamed anything but me because I was a fruitcake that was running this business the wrong way. 
And I used to speak like that and I was very open about it. I was very unembarrassed about it. I was unembarrassed because I was the problem. I didn't get it right. And I was very comfortable to say that. Another thing I was left with, take it on the chin. And people like it when you're open like that. Anyway, I start to get out and start to look. What can we do? How do we make a difference? What do we do? How do we grow? And I go to a lot of seminars. I had some help and I started to see the light. And I went to a lot of seminars, 42 in fact. In fact, there was a period there I was actually living at seminars. And I've got to say, the ideas I'm going to show you and what all the stuff that worked, essentially other people's ideas. So I can't stand up here and I wouldn't anyway, even if it was. Um, and I think I had a hand in a couple of them. But I must say that essentially they're not my ideas. But I was responsible for finding them, undercovering them. Want to make an omelette? Got to crack a few eggs. So I was making the omelette. One of the ideas I will take claim for is I went, I was smart enough to go and buy 50 books. You know, the, you go into a bookshop and you go, oh, what a great title. And you get the titles and you start searching for the titles and you, leadership legends and management magic and marketing towards 2000. Have you ever gone and bought business books and you've got those books at home and you've never ever read them? Yes or no? Do you feel a bit bad about that when you look at them with the cobwebs on them? So I was smart enough to go and buy the 50 books. But I wasn't smart enough to read them. And I had spent money. So I hired a personal book reader. <laughs> now, has anybody here got a personal trainer? Can I see hands? You've got, come on, help me out. Personal trainer. Hands up. Personal trainers. One. Must be more. Come on. Don't be embarrassed. One person. Well done. You know what you're trying to do? The guy over here is trying to get fit. Probably is fit. What do you have a personal trainer for? Because they turn up at your home and they're unreasonable. At 7 o'clock in the morning when you're rolling around in bed saying, oh, I think I should do some, oh, I won't. Oh, that's better. Well, they don't do that. They come and get you going, right? Well, a personal book reader read the books and then would meet me at 4 o'clock in the morning at Balmoral Beach and sit down with me and guess what? Share the stories. And guess what happened to me? Week after week after week, I watched myself grow. I actually started to grow. I actually realised I was becoming more philosophical. I remembered Stefan. You know the big hairdresser Stefan? Stefan asked me a question one night and I instantaneously had the answer. I just had the answer. And he said, that is sheer genius. Where do you get that stuff from? I said, it's all the time. It's a tap. Just... <laughs> so with all those things, one of the um, things that come to mind is someone turns around and says, you need to go out and survey your customers. You've got to go and talk to people that didn't buy your product. Now, have you had people out there that didn't buy your product? Yes or no? A very quiet room. Must be mega. Well done. Of course there are people out there that don't buy from you. So one of the sem seminars, the guy said, go and have the courage to talk to people that said no. Knock on doors. Whatever you've got to do, do it. Now, if you think that that's very, very, what sort of advice is that? Richard Branson has got an airline called Virgin Airline. Let me tell you that Richard Branson walked down the corridors of all the planes called British Airways and used to go and sit next to the passengers and say, but how do you find this flight from New York, you know, over to London? And the guy says, you know, well, it's all right. Well, do you find it boring? Yeah, it is a bit boring. Well, what would you like, what, what do you think they should do? Let's have a drink. And this guy would turn around and give you 15 or 20 things of what he didn't like about flying. So Branson had a list of 300 things on a bit of paper. Funny thing, he went to his staff and said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to open up an airline. And they said, Richard, what do, you know, you've been in the hot air balloons, Richard. Are you feeling well? And he turns around and opens up Virgin Airline. It's a $10 billion success. He actually sold his record business to be in the airline business. Now, what did he do? Where did he get the ideas from? People who were not even frequent flyers, who said, why are the pillows, why are the pillows this small? Why are the blankets this thin? Why can't you get a, you know, a hot chocolate on board? And all that stuff. And why don't they have nicer music? And he had 300 ideas. Richard Branson, I know it probably sounds like a coincidence, but it is, if it is, it's a $10 billion accident. Billion. So we get told, go out and talk to the customers. And one of the things we find out is that we have slobs. We employ tradesmen that used to walk up to people's homes looking like that, thought they were doing you a favour, and they would be doing their housekeeping on the way up the driveway. Oh, g'day, love, how you going? You're here to whack the alarm on the wall. Oh, wonderful, please come in. You know, they weren't very attractive, I've got to tell you. And some of them would have those big beer bellies, and, 
they would get up on the ladder, excuse me love, you know, give us a hand, would you help us line this up, would you? And they'd have the bum cleavage showing. <laughs> the blokes are really attractive with that bum cleavage. You know when the pants are down there like that? And they'd be reeking, reeking. I mean, they're out there today, imagine, you know, five or six jobs a day, reeking of BO. So we'd turn around and we created a new culture called We Care. It's not a perfect culture, ladies and gentlemen. Let me say right up front, it's far from perfect, but it does $150 million a year in sales today. As part of our group, we have other things, Thomas the Tank and Rosignal and the Ski Company. And, and that, but that's, that's the main part of our business. We trade in nine countries, and We Care started when we got all the installers' wives and put the wives in this corner. Now, what do you think? Do you think the installers' wives really knew anything about installing alarms, yes or no? Then over in this corner, we put all the installers, put them in here. Now, I've got to tell you, they knew a lot about installing alarms. Then we put the question to them. Once we walk in and stick the alarm on the wall, when it's done, and when we, what do we do then? The guy said, get the money and go to the next job. And we said, how about staying behind for maybe 10 minutes longer and doing a little extra, you know, some stuff that they don't expect? The blokes go, what do you mean, mate? <laughs> like what? Like helping. Like, no. <laughs> like, have a good life. Because it's a new company. It's about to be born. The ladies came out of the room. And they turn around when they come out of the room and they gave us 84 ideas on a list. The guys had seven. Their number one item, seven, this was their trump card. Ready? Well, if we're going to give them something, then it's easy just to give them something. So instead of doing anything, let's just give them a case of EB. The ladies had so much more empathy. You know, the ladies, they just, they just really understood and they had a warmth and they appreciated people. And the ladies really are the reason why today that we are, you know, in America and Belgium and Germany and Holland. One of the things they said, the lady at the door, she said, you should have people who are in uniform. Because the guy that knocked on our door in the black suit that had an appointment looked like the burglar. And... And one house I went to, you know, and I've got to tell you, you've got to know idea how valuable it is. You want conviction, you want deep-seated conviction, then take a U-turn and do what people don't do and call on 20 or 30 people. Don't try and sell them anything. Ask them why they didn't buy. What would we need to have done differently? Now, I want to ask you, do you, in your opinion, do you think people will be very upfront and tell you straight away why? Yes or no? The answer is no. Mostly they won't. They mostly won't be upfront. They mostly won't turn around and say, uh, yes, I would like to tell you the reason. We thought the guy was a jerk and we didn't like him. They don't want to get people into trouble. Number one, they don't want to get people. So you've got to turn around and say, look, here's a form I have. I would like if you could fill it out anonymously. Please dump the bucket on us because you know why? We are doing a shocking job. You must declare that things are bad. You must declare that you know they're bad. You must declare that you're looking for bad comments and that they would be helping you if they could give you some bad comments. And then you open up a tiny little door that they might just say, well, now you mention it, I've got to tell you, we weren't very happy with the way he did that. Oh, that's brilliant. Thank you so much. I'm going to make a note of that. And I'll tell you what, Pandora's box opens then. And you have no idea. One lady, she taught us more in an hour. I sat there, she said, I'll get my friend on the phone. He was a full-on. Look, we were going to ring the police on him. Oh, so I'm so glad you're telling me that. Got her on the phone. And we overhauled the company. Now, uniforms, doubled our sales. Installers started to wear uniforms, personal pride, hygiene, punctual. Aramis, you know what? They thought that the Wits, they thought that the Rex owner was an island up in the Wit Sundays. You know, they reeked these guys, so we went and put a little bit of Aramis onto them. Slippers. Now, why would you have slippers? Because it shows what? Care. Mrs. Brown, can I leave my shoes at the door and can I put my slippers on? Tiny thing. Tiny little thing. Means a lot. See the ground sheet there? That was simple. We didn't make much mess anyway, but the ladies all said, well, hang on, we're watching the midday show, and I'm telling you, they've got one eye firmly on the show and one eye <laughs> like a laser. So you've got to show that you're not going to do anything wrong. So you've got to turn around and say, look, Mrs. Brown, before I do any work, is it okay if I move a bit of furniture and I will work always on this rug? Or I'll put the, I'll put the mat over the top of this. So little things like that. We care, care. The outdoor siren used to go in. And then in 33%, now I stress, 33%, of homes, not all of the homes, we turn around when we're on the roof and ask the person seeing we're up there, do you mind if we check your roof and clean your tiles or clean your, 
check your roof for broken tiles or clean your gutters. Now, especially for some reason in Perth, they do a lot of these. And we've gone down and replaced 12 tiles, four tiles. You know, and people like, when you go down and say, look, we've just cleaned out your guttering, you may only do one home in every 10. I'm telling you, they never mention the alarm ever. They just always talk about the guy cleaned my roof. It's like it creates some special things. And before we leave, we say, here are some of the things we do in some of the homes. We ask, can we turn around and straighten and hang paintings? Can we change light bulbs? Now, our company spends 35 grand a year, thereabouts, 35 grand on light bulbs now. It's well over 30 grand a year. What do you reckon we were spending four years ago and we were going broke? Nothing. Light bulbs. And you know, not every home needs them. And we turn around and do that. We also turn around WD-40, the doors. They estimate we fix 150 doors a week. Now, is that a lot of doors? Not really, because we do 5,000 homes a month. We care. We have a we care person. What do they do? They're elderly people that turn around, that turn around and visit people's homes a week after the system. Now, if you've bought something and have you never heard from the people again, we have it happen to us all the time. So we've now got a lot of people calling on people's homes. And they go into the home and they turn around like, hi, I'm just here to visit and see if everything's okay. We give gift baskets. Some of our officers give flowers. Some give champagne. Some give chocolates. Some give nothing but just turn up. And, you know, they go in and they knock on the door and like, I'm just here to check everything. I tell you what, $100 an office, $100 a week, part-time. We have 60 and 70 and 80-year-old people doing it. And I tell you, you have no idea what it does for their life to be out there mixing with people. A lot of people out there, if you're 80, can't get a job. In Tasmania, Lorna is 81 years of age. She was 5 foot 7, now she's 4 foot 3 and shrinking. And she says, you know what, Brad, my husband died in 1961. I'm a chance. Chance for what, Lorna? I go to enough elderly men homes that they're single, I'm going to get my last five years hitched. And we've put her in the local news, at the FAI news flash. And now, our guy down there, she exclusively gets every person that's over 65 that's single. That's a man. And, and we, have a, we have a lady, in, um, a, a man in Ballarat who's uh, 70. He went to a home one morning in February last year. I'd like to say it was the 14th of February. I know the date was the 19th because he's never left that home from that second onwards. And he didn't have a stroke in there. Well, maybe, I don't know. Maybe he did. I'll tell you what he did have. What he did have is a smashing good time for half an hour because he's now married to her. Now that's added value. You know. <laughs> and I tell you now, Tom Peters says that you've got to get intimate with your customers. Intimate. It's very crucial. You've got to get into it out there. Magic moments. We call it magic moments. Let me put it to you another way. Where is your wow? Your wow. Where's the wow factor? And if you've been and watched these seminars before, I ask you this question. What have you done since you left here? Brian Menzies is in the front row from Flair here, and Brian is an instigator. He gets the idea and runs and gets excited and puts it into practice. Where is the wow factor? I've got a plumber that's gone out and he's got 21 magic moment things he does. Came along, went, unbelievable, that's what I'm going to do. And I said, go and interview the people that have had plumbers and, uh, and just ask them what three things they would like you to do that didn't happen when the plumber was in their home. Guess what he's done? He stopped after seven people. He said, but I don't need to. I, I have a list of things that people hate. So he's now got a wish list. And as a plumber, he delivers the wish list. So the question is, you've got to have a wow factor. You've got to have wow. It's just that simple. You know, it's not rocket science. This is not rocket science. Magic moments are little things that, you know, that matter, little things. Let me skip through a couple of examples. Richard Branson, what does he deliver on a plane? You know what, he, got, he asked people what they want and now he delivers it back. They have 14 people, 14 people who are flight attendants. Guess what they're trained to do? They're trained to massage. And they come down and they, they you know, could give you a little massage and they give a nice little massage like this for 10 minutes. And the lady's like, would you like, and they get someone to come along and play the shallow. And they, you, they serenade you while you're having a Chardonnay above the white fluffy clouds. Now, I'm a bit of a romantic at heart. And, you know, I'm telling you, I've never seen that on the airlines I fly with. And I love Qantas. But there's no one coming down serenading me on Qantas. And, you know, you're sitting above those fluffy clouds. You know what size pillow Richard Branson has? Their pillows are this big. And they actually fit between the arm of the chair and the corner of the window. And you're laying there and it's really comfortable. And they give you, not a blanket, paper thin. They give you a doona or... Would you like a duvet, as they put it? And you're laying back there on the plane, you've got your big... They put, by the way, they put a sheet. You know, a lot of people say, oh, actually, we don't like the fact the seats, you know. You never know who's been on that seat, sleeping and snorting, you know, grunting. And, and so they put a sheet on your seat. 
and they give you pajamas and you go and put your jammies on in the little cubicle and they've got the little virgin virgin jammies and you're laying back in your little seat and you've got your bloody beautiful pillow and you've you got your big dune and they come and give you a hot chocolate and a mug and then if you want to slip down and get your little 15 minute massage they come and do it in your seat now I'm telling you that's magic moments there's people you can't get on board one of their flights because people are buying a good time is he a discount airline yes or no no, he's not a discount. He's selling good times. He's selling feelings. He's selling feelings. And that's the thing. I guess, you know, they, they, they just keep expanding it out. Hey, you've got to start somewhere. Start tomorrow morning. In fact, that's too late. Start tonight. A wow. Where's your wow factor? That's what business needs to be. And if you think that if you've got a problem with this concept, let me ask you this. I'm only talking about Frank Harding throwing out boomerangs and doing more. If anyone has a process about where you succeed by doing less, I'd love you to share how it works because I, I don't know about shortcuts in life, but I've not been able to find any myself unless you do more. You know, that's Branson. He turns around then and one of his customers says, you know the thing we hate the most? What about this factor? What about the factor that you're on the plane and you land and you're only in London for a day and then when you decide to leave London, go back to Heathrow, guess what happens? You cop the five o'clock or whatever time traffic. Now, London or Heathrow in bad traffic can be an hour and a half. So a man came up with an idea how they could get to London to Heathrow or JFK to New York in 15 minutes. How do you think that was done? Helicopter is true, but very, very expensive and not a lot of fun to land a helicopter in the middle of London. How do you pick people up? So now they have a mobile phone service. You call this mobile number, you tell them where you are, and if you've only got two bags or a suit pack, they turn up in the Virgin Harley Fat Boy Express, <laughs> three wheels, you hop on the back, whoa-oh, you dump your bag in, and they're rocking you down the, they're rocking you down the transit lane on the way. They've got the music on, and the guy's got the Virgin, he's got the Virgin gear on. And like, you're on the way down in the Harley having a ball, 15-minute hoot. And you know what? They save a thousand people missing planes. They had one. They started with one to try it. You know what sort of people, it's in the paper. He's a, he's a public relations genius, Branson. And you know what happens? They've got one. They've now got a fleet of about 48, and people fly with them to ride the fat boy. Not because of the plane. <laughs> you know, you're selling fun. It's too short life not to have fun. You've got to have fun. You know, it's not a long time we're here for. It's a one-way ticket either. We're not coming back. You know, the Ritz Hotel. I stay at the Hyatt in Melbourne. Now, I don't want to bag the Hyatt because I stay there all the time. But I, I spent this year a quarter of a million bucks at the Hyatt Hotel in Collins Street alone. Just between you know, it's a fairly big account for someone that only goes down there six to eight times a year, and I never stay more than one night. Now, before you think I'm decadent and I have you know, the whole top floors. I just have a normal room. But I normally hire their conference room and I normally take four or five hundred people to breakfast. And Brian's been to one of our breakfasts. I think it was the Sher was it the Sheraton Brian we went to? And the Sheraton, you were there and there was 400 people. And I pay for these breakfasts. And I take certain business people to them. And so I pay the bill. And sometimes the bill, you know, it's 30 bucks a head. And you've got, you know, 500 people. They're expensive. We get 800 people there. Booked it for a day. And so I turn around, I turn around and I, and I stay there, I get home, and, let her hire it, that's nice. Dear Mr Cooper, your stay last week with us has led us to discover that in your departure you neglected to mention the charge for a bottle of Evian water from the minibar. Subsequently we've enclosed an invoice for $1.25, please pay ASAP. Oh. So I said, I'm not paying it. Three weeks later, a, an urgent final notice comes. So I'm just going to try this out. Two weeks later, another final notice comes. And they send me two bucks fifty worth of dirty letters. Now, why wouldn't they say, what a nice magic moment to send to Mr. Cooper. Dear Mr. Cooper, we know, we know that there's a lot of accommodation in Melbourne, and we know the competition's tough, but we thank you very much for continuing to stay with the height. You think their computer tells, it tells them? So I'm a gold member there as well. And we know competition's tough, so thanks for continuing to stay with us. Recently, a charge from the minibar was not put to your account. Cheers, that drink's on us. And we've put aside a bottle of champagne that's in the manager's office, Verve Clico, when you arrive in your next trip to Melbourne. We look forward to seeing you again. Kindest and best regards, the happy Hyatt. Now, how do you think I'm going to feel about, you know, someone sending me dirty letters for a buck? 
We have a girl at FAI that does cover notes. You know what? People ring up, get a quote, and she sends them out the information. How do you add value in a serviceless job like that? Well, she puts, she has a conversation. The other girls mostly, thank you very much, thank you for calling FAI, goodbye. She turns around and puts her heart and so she has a 20, 30, 40 second conversation. Tell them I can hear little kitties in the background. How old are they? Oh, that's wonderful. Are they over the teething yet? Oh, yeah, well, actually, funny you should mention that, blah, blah, blah. And she strikes up rapport. She puts a little smiley face and a personalised PS. We have found out when we've analysed her work that she gets 16%. 16% more business than other girls that work in the room. And there is 75 girls there. It's not a bad test what she's selling. People buy feelings. They're buying feelings. That's what they're buying. You know, my, my very, I love this example of the guy who's my mate that has the coffee shop. There's 25, 26 coffee shops in Mossman. They sell cappuccinos. His shop has 25% more. And if you're a regular customer, if you're regular, the girls were empowered, empowered to say, hey, listen, you come here a fair bit. What's your name? Oh, it's uh, KD. What was your, do you ever have a nickname? Oh, yeah, it was, you know, Sluggo was my nickname, whatever. And then you go back in there four days later, and they've got your very own porcelain, beautiful, verse, and you've got your own picture. Susan's a swimmer. By the way, Sluggo's got his red boxing gloves on there, and he used to fancy himself. So you've got Sluggo, and they put it on the wall. And the next time you come in, they say, listen, have your own cappuccino. Have your own cappuccino. And it's 25% more, and it's frothing over here, and then they actually put, how you have it? Now the new one, skinny milk one, you know, long black, blah, blah, whatever you want. You have it there, under there, and you've got your name. And like, people buy coffee, they buy stuff. Five bucks, what's he built? A highway to their heart for five dollars. You think they're going down the road? Like, he's just, he has just nuked 25 other shops. They are queuing up there to get in. It's got the best vibe because the people that love it. And you know what? Activity creates activity. Fun creates fun. Lightness creates lightness. Don't sell products, sell Disneyland. Create magic, get a wow factor. Okay, very, very, very important. You're selling feelings, not products. If you don't think I'm right, then remember the time you got sold a great product? When did you last go and buy, buy the best the best meal, stunning meal, but the waiter or waitress made you feel a little bit yuck, a little bit not right. Have you ever been treated badly in a restaurant when you're out with someone special? Yes or no? And the food's great? Do you go back? You sure about that? Ever been to a restaurant where the food was pretty bloody ordinary but the person made you feel fantastic? Do you go back? You know what you do? You forget about the food. You care about your feelings. So if you don't think, you think you vote with your wallet, you vote, don't with your toast buds, you don't vote with your... What about the eight guys in the kitchen? Running around in the kitchen and they're out there trying to get a good meal. They're sweating and they put the food up. And that girl or guy may be in a bad mood and they dump the plate a little bit louder. And you think, whoa, what a, you, know, you, you actually know what you're thinking, right? And you don't go back. But the person might treat you really nice and you do go back. And you go back and you go back and you go back because you are voting with your heart. Hey, you think you're dealing with people's hair? You think you're dealing with their knee? You think you're dealing with their shin bone or anything? You're not dealing with their skin. You're dealing with their heart and their soul. That's what people need to know. That's what they need to know because that's what you're dealing with. Frank Harding had it right when he said, throw out the boomerang, they come back. And I'm telling you, the most invaluable customer needs to be treated special. The reasonably good customer needs to be treated unbelievably special, and the good customer beyond, beyond special. So I just want to make a couple of points. You may want to take a couple of notes, write them down somewhere if you wish. Number one, get gutsy. Get gutsy. Number one, get gutsy. Number two, Lead or follow. Number three, get intimate with your customer. Not your staff. Get intimate. Number four, realize the power of feelings. Realize the power of feelings. Number five, create a magic moments factor. Number six, 
Think wow. And if you do those things, it's going to make a major difference. There's a lady in Double Bay said to me, you know, but that's okay for you, but like you sell something, I sell, I sell a service. How do I get people, people to turn around and buy it? And I said, well, go and have a little marquee, go to Double Bay, put the marquee up and do free massages. So you know what she does now? She provides 15-minute free massages. There's a little thing you get on like that, you undo your stuff and they put it over in a marquee and they give you a 15-minute back massage or a 10-minute poor massage free of charge. Then when you leave and you feel pretty happy, guess what they give you? A 50% discount voucher. What do you think's happened to a business? Absolutely you can't get in. You know why? Because she gives away 180 on a Saturday, all day, three girls, and then that feeds them for the next six months. Because people become introduced to it. Introduction. Get them in. Introductionary offer. You know, you want to wait for opportunity doesn't knock. Little Woody's not coming. Want to make an omelette? Crack a few eggs. That's it. Okay. Now, it's one thing to have stuff like that for your staff. It's one thing to do that, but it's another thing I've got to say to you to, to look after your customers. It's another thing to look after your staff. And we have a little program at FAI. We call it Magic Moments. It's our work culture. Now, we started small. We started with thank yous. We started with letters. And an extreme version, but it's very common, but an extreme version is we had a young girl that worked for us, and we sent her a really, really nice letter because we couldn't pay anyone, we had no money. And we sent her a thank you letter and it went something like, Dear, Dear Kylie, I cannot tell you how impressed I am with your gutsy effort in the last two weeks. I know of four nights when you've stayed back to midnight and I've been told that you had to be ordered to go home. For someone at 17, I am so proud. At 17, my experience is people want to get out the door at one second past five. I am so proud that you work for nothing to help us out. It's no secret that times are tough. And tough times call for tough people. I depend on you more than you'll ever believe. Thank you from the bottom of my heart, Brad Cooper. P.S. I'll never forget it. And her mum rang me up crying and said, my little daughter has just carries this letter around the home and reads it about eight times a night. You know, appreciation costs how much? You know, some people go to, go to their grave and they don't turn around. They've never sent a thank you letter in their life. You know? Even in their will, they just give away stuff and there's no thank you. You know, P.S., please enjoy my motorbike for the rest of your life, and thanks for being my mate during my life. Nothing. Just motorbike, like an auction. You get that. Well, who got that? Well, you get the caravan. You know, you've got to say thank you. It's so important. You know, it doesn't cost anything. You've got to do stuff extra. We have at our company, we just put some little things in. You know, we started by thank yous. We had no money, remember? Hey, a lot of thank yous went out. A lot of thank yous. And then I started getting my lunch cooked, $10 an hour. 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock, and Adelaida cooks my lunch. And then I thought, well, if she cooks my lunch, why doesn't she cook your lunch? So all our kids at work started getting their lunch cooked. And then I appreciated all the effort that people put in. By the way, life's a boomerang. So I started doing extra things for them, and they did extra stuff for me. So then we got a masseuse to come in on Fridays, and everyone gets a hand massage and a manicure. We have our own staff actually employ people now. In fact, none of our management are involved in the employment of people. I'll tell you why. Because our people know better what they want to work with than we do. And, you know, they actually employ their own people. It's fascinating. Empowerment. We have a little video, a staff video here, an FAI video. We're just going to show you very briefly. The whole idea of this meeting is we, we've, had, we've created some magic moments in our place. We want to have a good work theme, a place that can be fun. FAI, Julie speaking. You feel that you want to do well for the company. You feel that you want to work for the company to be a part of its success and be a part of its growth. And achieving sales levels that, that you didn't really think were possible. So the difference with our staff culture is that the, the senior management actually believe in it. You know, it's just a, a very special culture that, that Brad, without even trying, has, um, has built. Long weekends by the dozen if you go the extra mile. Everyone can tell the FAI story because everyone's lived it. Everything is from the heart and you feel it, so therefore you give of your heart. What magic moments can we come up with? in the work environment. There's gyms, there's lunches, there's appreciation.
it's like a family here. You know, it really is. It's like a real family. We emulate exactly the same thing to the people who are working under us. We give them the same freedoms, the same help wherever we can. What we really want is to have an environment where, where we do a lot for you because you do so much for us. People are prepared to do whatever it takes to get the job done. That's the general attitude of all of the staff in the place. They just love it here. Very caring culture. That's what makes a difference to me. Come and work with FAI and all the others along with Brad. They come to work, they are under pressure, but they do have fun in what they do. They, nobody ever looks at the clock or questions how much longer they have to work if they have to come and work on a Saturday or a Sunday. Nobody even questions it. Not, not just a faceless, nameless part of the machinery. You know, you're actually valued where you are. Um, that, and that filters down from above. I know by the way that I treat my staff, which is, is an exact mirror of the way my managers treat me or the owners of the company treat me, that I get the best out of them. So therefore, what has been achieved is the perfect staff culture. It filters all the way down. I absolutely love it. I hope I'm here till the day I die. I really do. You know, and that's sort of like one of the little things, that that's a bit of an insight in. Um, we have a lot of little things happen that are quite special. Uh, the magic moments we put in place is because we can't pay our people back for what they've done. They've built our company. I never can appreciate enough the people that we have there, and that is the boomerang. That's Frank Harding. You know, we have a lot of cute things that the kids know if they want to go home early or anything. They just, you know, no one abuses the system. And guess what? If someone did, I tell you what, they stand out. The heart that gives is the heart that gathers. This is not rough, tough business stuff, is it? Hey, this is simple. Heart that gives is a heart that gathers. By the way, I saw this, and it's really nice, and I think it typifies some of the stuff here. Even if our efforts of attention seem for years to be producing no result, one day a light that is in exact proportion to them will flood the soul. And I believe that one million percent. Except I think it's inaccurate. I actually think it's understated. I think whatever you put out, you get back more, providing you don't have an ulterior motive. So throw those boomerang. Please throw those boomerangs. It's so, 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 so important. And you can go and look at any business, but you know what? Put people, people before profits. You know, be a bit different. You know, just do stuff that's different. I got a Nike runner dumped on my desk. I walk in, there's stuff everywhere, but there's a Nike runner standing on top with a card attached. And it says something, I've, I've got the card in my office, but it says something like, um, Mr. Cooper, as you know, trying to get one foot in the door is the key to life. We, we need nine minutes with you. It's a fast talk, like a fast runner. And we will be in and be out like a flash. Of course, when we get to meet you, we'll bring in the other Nike runner. You'll have the best shoes that money can buy and we'll give you the best advice that, wait and see. And like I said, I'm saying, get him on the phone right now. I want him here now. You know, another guy wrote us a letter and he basically wanted to review our software. Now, when they come and review your software, he wanted to do that. You know why he wanted to do it? To see if our software was any good. So he said, I said, no, we're right for software. But I must say, I was a bit concerned about my software expenditure. In a growing company, we've spent a fortune. So you know what he turns around and does? He says, listen, let me have 10 minutes with somebody else in your company. I don't want to bother you. And I'll give you an honest assessment. I said, well, I'm not going to make you any promises. He said, no, sure. He comes in, sees Terry Youngman, my general manager, spends 10 minutes, spends 20 minutes, gets involved, blah, 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 blah. And you know what he turns around and does? He turns around and he turns around and spends the day and I get back from a meeting in the state and I walk into my office and there's a black, black box in front of me on the desk. I, I open up the black box, it's a 1987 bottle of Grange Hermitage. And the letter says, Brad, there are some times in life you should put your feet up and celebrate. You have one of the best software packages I've ever seen. I can't fold it. Congratulations. Well done. Stick to them like Araldite. I mean, I'm on the phone. Get me that guy on the phone. It's unbelievable. So just do stuff and think outside the dot. Make an impact. Make an impression. That's what you have to do. You've got to think a little bit differently. Okay. The risk reversal. You know, they talk, the boys talked about guarantees. Just try stuff. What civic videos reversal? That's video easy. 
Let's get it right. Video easy. Movie of the month or? First time, get it first time, it's free. Do you reckon they've always got them there? No, it's impossible. How could they have them every time? If everyone knows if you go there, you get it. But guess what? People have got good natures. And 98% of people go in there, and you know what they say? Oh, don't worry about it. Listen, you guys try. Some people go in there and say, give me my movie free, pal. That's okay. Have a look at the size of their stores. Do you think they're a shrinking type of operation? They're a mega store. What does that tell you? Mega success. Think outside the dots. Civic Video. They turn around. What's their theme? Love it or it's free. Yeah, well, like, you know, have you loved every movie you've seen? So you, your life would be a never-ending free movie. Didn't love it. <laughs> your membership would just be like, didn't love it. Bloke in Coffs I said, you know, have you loved, what, you know, have you ever seen a movie you didn't love? And he goes, wedding video. <laughs> <laughs> and so, gu guarantees. You know how Thomas the Tank, we're just testing it. It's only new. Test your guarantees too. Test it before you drive it. And with Thomas the Tank, we have a guarantee just being implemented. Mum goes into the shopping centre, she sees Thomas the Tank bed. They're 600 bucks. They're high gloss, they're beautiful, and they are really nice, and guess what, they've got a doona, and the kids sleep secure in bed with Thomas. Now, Mum goes, well, I really like it, and the kids like going, eyes are spinning and rolling. The kids like gone gaga, and Mum's like, I think I have to speak to my husband. Well, don't worry, Mr. Jones, we'll have it delivered by... Um, who's the control? Yeah, the controller. We'll have the controller. He delivers it with a couple of pillows stuck underneath his belly. Big little fat with his controller uniform on. Take it for a month. Try it. See how your little baby loves it. And if there's any problems in a month, we'll come and pick it up. No charge. I'm telling you, you go to that home and take out that bed. <laughs> you even try and take the brochure off the kid. In the shopping centre, they tested it in Melbourne, right, in one of the Westfield centres. They took the brochure off the kid and there was like, they had the, it was a breakout. This kid looked, it had eardrums bursting. He went, he absolutely went ballistic. Test it. Rupert Murdoch nearly went broke with Sky TV. One million pounds a week losses. The Poms didn't buy it. You know why? They thought it was too technical. Wizards on the roof didn't buy it. You know what? They turned around and didn't buy it. They wanted to wait till other people bought it. They didn't buy it either. So Sam Chisholm said, I tell you what, the Poms like a free deal. Give them a month for free. Put soccer. And they did this package. Rain Man, soccer, Premier League, FA Cup. You got Jurassic Park. You got 60 movies for free. Test it. We'll deliver it. You use it. Watch it. Enjoy it. It's free. And if you don't like it, we pick it up. Otherwise, it's £14 a month. 54% of people honestly up front said, we are testing it and we know we're not buying it. 98% of people never sent it back. You know, you've got to trust people. Just be careful. But most people are very, very honest. And I would like to leave you with, with this. Two things. I had a man come up to me in Wollongong yesterday and he said after the event, can I see you? And he, and he had a little... He said, can I see you for a sec? And he stood there in his suit and he said... That helps all them, mate, but what do I do? Last Friday, my place got liquidated where I work. They didn't give me any notice liquidation. I'm not going to get my pay. Four months ago, I got retrenched. Nine months before that, I got retrenched. Two years ago, my partner walked out and stole the profits, and I was left high and dry paying the bills. Five years ago, I got retrenched. I've had five retrenchments, and I've had a partner run away, and now my job, and I haven't told my wife yet. What do I do? Do I drive my family and my three kids over a cliff? What do I do? What's your advice? And I said, I think things are fine. Sir, take a pen and paper, sit over there and write this down. You are in fantastic shape. You're about 50, am I right? He said, 53. I said, you're in great shape. Some people would give the world to be in the shape you're in. You have a nice suit on, sir. You obviously have personal pride. You spoke to me quite nicely. You, you're well presented. And guess what? You even had a small smile when you first walked up. And you've had a few... Did you actually cause that company to go broke? Did you cause it to go broke? No. Was it your fault your partner ran away and was dishonest? No. Have you ever heard that telecom retrenched 27,000 people when they made three billion? Have you ever heard that IBM retrenched 70,000? Are they success stories? Sir, life deals us out a few cards that are sometimes a bit rough. But I bet you you're a real nice person inside that really, really cares. And I bet if you did a list of all your good points, that list would be long and your bad points would be very few. You don't take your car over the cliff, sir. You just go on trucking. And I said, do me a favour. 
and I took a video which I got such an impact out of that I am going to show it to you now. And this is about having a laugh in life because you know what? We are so rich in this country. And I took him up to one of the rooms, Candace is here tonight, took him up to one of the rooms and put this video on and he came back and he had a massive smile on his face. And then I sent him over to Brian Sher and Brian Sher from Vision gave him a job. His life turned around in four minutes. In his 25 years, John Cootis has ridden a lifetime of feelings. Oh, there's no use in feeling down, mate. It just, it's no good for you physically or mentally. It doesn't get you anywhere. His outlook has positive and mischievous. Stump cam. Born without legs, John has played indoor cricket for more years than he remembers. He thinks it's 11. I had a runner, believe it or not. I had a runner when we first started, when I was younger. And he just came up and said, oh, you know, I want a game, I want a game. I said, we'll see what we can do. And we got the manager, we made a couple of rules up for him and on a trial basis and just went from there and it worked and he's been playing ever since. The love for sport has carried John far beyond his early dreams. Really, I thought he was quite amazing, you know. I, I, I didn't believe a guy, you know, could do the things that he could do, you know, with... Obviously, he's not built the same as an average person, so, but, uh, you know, he does, he does the same things as all of us, if not more, so, you know, he's an inspiration to all the guys at cricket, and that's, that's why they love having him, having him around. After meeting Steve Waugh four years ago, John has developed ah! a special bond with many of the Australian players. Last year, he toured South Africa. Geez, Albie Mangle here reporting from the Sharps' backyard. Oh, <laughs> just went up by a uh, unidentified flying tennis ball. From Steve Waugh's neighbours to Sydney's Bankstown Cricket Club, Jono stirs emotions. He's our, our co-manager and uh, he's been doing a great job though. Can't bag him too much. He just gets under everyone's feet. Yeah, <laughs> literally. <laughs> John Cutis is a joker. Everyone's mate with an infectious attitude. You haven't got a good personality, you haven't got anything, you have a good character. So if you can't laugh at life or laugh at yourself virtually, you can't do anything. So, jeez. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> I think that made that guy feel pretty, pretty special after that. So I leave you with that. Thanks for being a really nice audience and making me feel comfortable. I'm still finding my feet up. You probably look up and say, I look like I know what I'm doing up here and I'm pretty confident, but I'm still finding my feet and it's nice to go in front of an audience and to be able to know you've made a little difference. You know, my little lot in life's been pretty good of late. I'm sure I'll have some turbulence along the line. I fly a lot. When I get on those planes, I notice when the captain says, well, Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. This is Captain Brown. We're going over to London today. Welcome on board. We're happy to have you on the kangaroo, and we're going to take you up over the Ayers Rock. And I love it when that pilot sounds like they know what they're doing. You know when you get the odd pilot? Um, ladies and gentlemen, a Qantas flight a, a, a QF69, thanks for flying with us today. And then there's a silence, and you think, hang on, what the bloody hell, why is there that silence? Then you feel a bump, and, and they come back, and they've got that insipid voice. I want to be in safe hands, and I don't care if I'm not. I just want to think I am. And I fly a lot, and I always listen to that voice. And someone might be talking, oh, hang on, what's he sound like? Is he like the sort of guy I want taking me on my journey? Well, you're on your own journey, and uh, on your journey, journey, remember perception is reality, and reality is fact. Please build your life certainty, be strong, be, be out there, and build it with boomerangs. I normally tell a story about a butcher that's very special. I'm not going to tell that because some of you have heard it before, and I know it's very, it's very moving for me, but I will leave you with this. The greatest joy in life is not from taking. It's from giving. And the more you give, the more you gather. I stood in a little bar one night in New York, in 1989 or 1990 and I had dinner with four brash New Yorkers in a bistro. When we walked into the bistro and sat down, we were dining and it was like pretty noisy, smoky, full on and I looked through past the plant and against the wall, I saw two physically handicapped girls sitting at the bar 
and there wasn't many people in the bar because it was pretty quiet, but the man played some nice music. We were in the restaurant, and as the night went on, we had some Chardonnay, and we had, you know, the bar got a bit fuller. And as I looked through that bar, I saw this girl poking a finger at her girlfriend, teasing her type of stuff, and gesturing, and, and jeering her up. And then I saw the girl get off the stool and her hand was a bit bent and I could see her head and her ear wasn't, it was just she had some deformities. And she walked across to a man who had braces on and she whispered something in his, his ear and, and gestured towards the dance floor. And the man put up his hand and went, so it was music, so he probably he put up his hand and went, and gestured her away with a wave of the hand. He could have done anything, but he gave a wave of the hand away. That girl went and sat back on that chair, and I watched her whole body language just drop. Just drop. And we see some things in life that are a bit of a kick in the guts, and I thought, I bet if she asked him to dance, you know, maybe, maybe they know each other, I don't know. 20 minutes later, the girl that had her head down had another drink and probably G'd her and her, and then she said to her girlfriend, it's your turn. And the other girl got off and asked another guy to dance in a suit. He shook his head and said, no thanks. Sat down and I watched both of them. And I thought, we go through life and we can make a difference if we want to. You know, and you, know, you may say that I did this for me. I'll tell you what I did it for. I did it because I knew this was going to make them feel special. And I don't know how many boomerangs you've got to throw out, but I believe in life, you drop the pebble in the pond and it's going to send out a ripple effect. Drop lots of pebbles because you never know where that ripple ends. Believe me, they come back. One in every 50 comes back. And I looked at those girls and I said to the maitre, excuse me, mate, can you get me those flowers? Can I buy those flowers at the front desk? And he said, no, we're a restaurant, we don't sell the flowers. And I said, well, you don't sell them. Will that buy them? He said, sir, the flowers are yours. <laughs> I went up and I got a bottle of Verve Clico. I took those flowers, I excused myself from the table. I walked around and I wandered up with my beautiful best suit on. And I was feeling great. You know, you're in another country and you're feeling a bit excited. And I walked up. And I said, excuse me, girls, I said, I wonder if I could ask you a favour. I'm, I'm not from around here, and I don't know anyone, and I wondered, I've bought a bottle of champagne, I've got some flowers, I wonder if I could have a glass of champagne and maybe a dance with you girls. And you should have seen the look on their faces. But you know what I didn't, you know didn't realise? I didn't forgot about my Australian accent. You know what that made them feel like? Where are you? Australia, and it was like their lot, it was Christmas time. Hey, I'll tell you what. They felt pretty special from that moment on, and so did I. Go out and drop as many pebbles in the pond as you can. That's what this world's about. We leave it. There's no turning back. Drop the pebbles and do it now. God bless. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.